Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12343 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the National Marine Plan. Could I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Richard Lockhead to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 13 minutes, please. Presenting officer, I am pleased we are able to debate Scotland's first National Marine Plan, and I will begin by thanking the stakeholders who have played such an important part in shaping the plan. A diverse range of interests have contributed thoughtfully and helpfully and have played a constructive role in the process. I also want to thank the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee for their scrutiny. I set out my response to their thoughtful recommendations earlier this week. And I note the positive comments made by stakeholders during that particular process. For example, Callum Duncan, representing Scottish Environment Link, stated that we welcome the National Marine Plan as a step change in the management of our seas. So marine planning is new and, of course, important. We do need to act now to put in place a framework that will promote marine activity and ensure our unique marine environment is safeguarded. Scotland's natural resources are, of course, world famous. Our seas are very much part of a very rich legacy. In fact, our sea area is six times the land mass of Scotland. I'll repeat that, six times the land mass of Scotland. That's over 460,000 square kilometres of some of the most productive and diverse waters in the whole of the planet. These seas support habitats ranging from shallow estuaries to deep sea coral reefs and over 6,000 marine species, including over 20 species of marine mammals, such as seals and dolphins. Our seabird population is vast, as large as our human population, and includes a number of protected species. So I take the responsibility of protecting the environment for future generations extremely seriously, not only for families in Scotland, but climate change is a global issue, for instance, and we must contribute what we can do in terms of a global response as well. And the seas, of course, don't respect boundaries. We must work in partnership across sectors and nations to manage them well. That is why I did lead the development of a new legislative framework, the Marine Scotland Act 2010, through this Parliament. The Act requires us to have a marine plan which sets out policies for the sustainable development of Scotland's seas, including economic, social, climate change and ecosystem objectives. That is, a plan which respects the stunning environment and supports our amazingly productive marine industries and allows for new industries potentially to emerge as well. Our diverse industries illustrate why we must have proper safeguards in place to protect our rich natural assets and those who make a living from them. As we are all aware, a number of recent incidents, such as the large cargo ship running aground at Ardamurkin Point yesterday, highlight the very real risks we must guard against and respond to. As things stand, the UK Government is responsible for determining the appropriate levels of provision to protect ships passing through our waters. And there have now been three significant incidents in our waters involving large vessels in the past few months alone, reminding us all of the need to protect not only human life, but our precious marine environment. Yet, we still have the unacceptable situation that sees some of Europe's largest and busiest waters only protected with one emergency towing vessel berthed in the Northern Isles, potentially leaving our waters on the West Coast in particular severely exposed. I have raised this issue with the UK Government a number of times since the decision to slash funding in half the number of emergency tugs in our waters. Most recently, I wrote in November requesting an early discussion on the current situation of funding beyond next year, following the incident involving a shipment of radioactive waste in our waters, but I have yet to receive an acceptable response and firm commitment around this issue. So today I can tell the Chamber I am writing the strongest terms to the UK Government, urging it to immediately review the current provision and call on it to guarantee future funding for appropriate provision beyond 2016 when the current arrangements come to an end. As things stand, presiding officer, by Easter 2016 next year, we could be without any cover in Scotland's waters from that tug service. But given their economic and environmental importance, we simply can't afford to gamble with our seas. So the UK Government needs to recognise the potential cost of leaving our seas vulnerable rather than be obsessed with the cost of maintaining adequate emergency tug provision. Now, of course, <clears throat> that's not the only barrier to genuine integrated management of our seas. The current arrangements that govern the Crown Estate are also well documented, and their assets in Scotland include, include around 50% of the foreshore, almost all of the seabed out to 12 nautical miles, 
and associated rights on the continental shelf beyond 12 nautical miles. Today, I also call on the UK Government to confirm it will deliver full legislative de devolution for all our assets in terms of the Crown estate assets for all our seas out to 200 nautical miles. That will enable the National Marine Plan to genuinely move forward to cover all activity, including reserved activities, out to 200 nautical miles. And this means that future decisions, including those by the UK Government and the Crown Estate, must take account of the policies about safeguarding Scottish interests that are set out in the plan. <clears throat> yeah. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I wonder, Minister, if uh, he is aware of the very real concerns that many of the fishermen whom I represent uh, in this Parliament have when they see, uh, beyond the 12-mile limit in particular, uh, fishing boats from other nations operating in a quite different way from our own to their disadvantage. Will the Minister call on the UK Government to enable us to have greater powers so that we have equality of access to our waters? Cabinet Secretary. Well, unfortunately, the Marine Plan does not usurp the common fisheries policy. However, it is certainly the policy position of the Scottish Government that we are pursuing a level playing field in Scottish waters, and that's a point we're making very strongly to the UK Government, so that fishermen fishing side by side are subject to the same kind of rules and regimes. But turning back to the plan, I just want to say the plan is about delivering sustainable development and through an ecosystem approach to achieve our vision for seas that are clean and safe, healthy and biologically diverse, productive and managed to meet the long-term needs of nature and people. The sea provides a range of goods from fertiliser to pharmaceuticals and critical services such as climate uh, regulation and, and breaking down waste as well. There are many other types of benefits as well. We who can fail to value the, the feel-good factor of a simple walk along the shore, our pride in our maritime history as a nation and our culture, or the inspiration the sea can bring to novelists or poets or filmmakers in this country as well. Now, sustainability means taking account of and reflecting all these different kinds of benefits. We know it's possible for the environment to thrive alongside development. The plan seeks to ensure that this is always our approach, to create a framework which ensures that development in our seas is always staying within environmental limits. Sure. Tavi Scott. To the Minister for giving way. Has he come to a considered view on the bearing of seabed cables on his point about development, given that the fibre optic cable between Faroe, Shetland and the Scottish mainland has been dredged up in the past? Has he come to a final view as to how best to deal with that particular issue? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly, as the Marine Plan lays out, and as was discussed with the committee, uh, al although we are willing to review the wording, as I agreed with the, the committee, uh, and in line with their recommendations, uh, the position is that we want uh, repairs to any cables to be carried out as quickly as possible. When it comes to laying new cables underground, clearly there are some processes that have to be gone through, but we want these to be timely, so things are not held up. Can I also say that the key to some of the objectives I've just laid out are the general policies and objectives which form the core of the marine plan. These reflect the high-level marine objectives agreed across the whole of the UK, not just in Scotland, and of course reflect the descriptors of the good environmental status that flows out of the Europe's Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So that does ensure the plan is consistent with existing UK and European frameworks, as well as reflecting the needs of our ecosystem at the same time. The plan also aligns with the guiding principles of sustainable development, which include achieving a sustainable economy, promoting good governance, using sound science, creating a strong, healthy and just society, and of course, as I said before, living within our environmental limits. And I, I very much welcome the committee's endorsement of that approach. The general policies highlight the need for sound science as well, and a good evidence base, of course, is crucial to making the correct decisions. And I'm very proud of the development of Scotland's Marine Atlas and the evolution of the National Marine Plan Interactive, which now enables over 500 of spatial data layers to be made available to planners online. And of course, again, that supports the committee's proposal that it should be at the centre of marine planning. We are, however, committed to commissioning new science and research to support the ongoing development and our understanding of environmental impacts. So new information will continue to be made available online as widely as possible and inform the monitoring and reviewing of the plan in the times ahead. The policies also highlight adaptive management, which is critical to the development of the decision-making processes in the future, which is another issue that the committee raised with me uh, when I appeared before them. We can't ever have perfect knowledge. We always have to consider the evidence and adapt our approaches so we can ensure the outcomes are the ones we want to get. The policies also promote an understanding of the cumulative impact of projects and developments. 
so the sum of all activities within an area remains within that area's environmental limits. So marine planning provides a single framework which allows all that evidence to be considered in the rounds, a framework which I do believe does provide clarity but allows for flexibility and adaptation to changing circumstances. The planning process is also an opportunity for participation and discussion of the evidence and for different perspectives and interests to be represented. The process of planning for, for marine protected areas, for instance, and renewables demonstrates that. There has been a great deal of public interaction and engagement. The proposals are evidence-based and take account of the experience and views of local communities. But we will continue to explore ways to improve upon that, build up even more evidence to make sure we are reflecting up-to-date knowledge. I have been clear throughout this process that we are required to strike a number of delicate balances. Scotland's seas are diverse, so are the many and varied activities which take place on our coasts, under the seabed and right through the water column. Developing a plan which is comprehensive and clear, but remains user-friendly and allows for this range of diversity is, of course, challenging. Nevertheless, I believe the plan does strike this balance appropriately, notwithstanding the fact that I am open to making changes before adopting the final plan in line with the Committee's recommendations. But the engagement we have had so far has been very influential. A pre-consultation draft was issued in 2011, prior to formal consultation in 2013, and there was over 30 public meetings. And there's been ongoing discussions within the Marine Strategy Forum and in other forums uh, as well. If we take one example from the last few weeks that perhaps sums up the, the, the need to strike an appropriate balance, the committee reflected their views on the need to protect fishing, but the need to control fishing was the focus of Highland Council's response to their consultation on the management of protected areas. There has also been a number of debates about the benefits of our oil and gas sector or aquaculture industries uh, versus, of course, the need to transition to renewable energy on the one hand and control environmental impacts of aquaculture on the other. So, although we are looking for a single framework and consistency, we do, of course, have to acknowledge that we do have to be flexible. On adoption, the National Marine Plan will be the first statutory national plan in all of these islands. The first plan was for the East Marine region of English waters, but ours is the first national plan. Our approach is distinct. We have sought to ensure sufficient consistency for those industries which operate at a UK, European and global level. And we are currently discussing the monitoring and reviewing of the plans with colleagues in the Marine Management Organisation in Newcastle, and that will feed into the next cycle of planning uh, as well. But I do remain committed to the development of regional planning, in line with our belief that those most affected by the decisions should be as closely involved as possible in the decision-making process. Now, regional planning will be evolutionary, and there are legitimate questions regarding governance, structures and resources. We will work hard on these in the times ahead. But of course, we are phasing the rollout and starting with marine planning partnerships in Shetland and in Clyde, two very different areas which both have strong history of dealing with marine issues. So these lessons will be learnt and taken forward in terms of developing the other regions. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, if I can just say that I hope what I've said so far has demonstrated that I very much recognise the balance which the plan has to strike. I am happy to reflect further on any particular issues, but I'd like to close by reiterating that we need to act now to get a framework in place that will demonstrate Scotland's commitment to improve management of our seas, a framework which will do, demonstrate our commitment to the marine environment and marine industries alike, and will provide for truly sustainable development of our wonderful marine resources in Scottish waters. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Claudia Beamish to speak to and move Amendment 12343.2. Nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour values this opportunity for additional scrutiny that this debate on the draft National Marine Plan brings. The draft NMP must provide, as the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted, a vision and a framework for the future underpinned by sustainable development. Leading from the Marine Act 2010, supported by this statutory obligation, we must ensure that Scotland seas are sustainable and that marine biodiversity is at the heart of the plan. Through the recovery, protection and, I stress, enhancement of the health of our seas. At the start of this Scottish Environment Week, I held a hermit crab in my hand, here in the Scottish Parliament. It came out of its shell home to check me out as I checked it out. Its delicate grace and inquisitiveness were palpable. I carefully placed it back in the small tank 
and may I reassure the Chamber it was returned to the sea by the Marine Conservation Society on Monday night. From families who marvelled at the sea lice, see, there we go, the sea life in the, in the small tanks here in the Scottish Parliament on Monday, and along with so many others who enjoy our coastal waters and our beaches, to the surveyor who maps out the new onshore wind, wind site, we all have a responsibility to treat our marine environment with respect. Our sustainable marine industries are fundamental to Scotland's future. As a Cabinet Secretary said today, within environmental limits, our seas are vital, of course, for sustainable sources of protein, from which it is hoped there will be an increasing range of fish, the development of marine renewables helping meet our climate targets, oil and gas, the, capture, the carbon capture and storage, which not many people have talked about so far in the, in the Rural Affairs Committee, our shipping supported by ports and harbours. It is in this context that the Raki Committee issued a quite hard-hitting report. The committee, I quote, believes that the general principles set out in the draft plan provide an important framework and reinforce sustainability as the overarching principle. However, the committee is concerned that the draft as it currently stands is in parts too detailed and prescriptive and in other parts too vague and therefore requires amendment to make it fully fit for purpose. While I acknowledge the point made by the Cabinet Secretary in his response to our committee, that the varying level of prescription reflects a number of factors, including the current state of the evidence base, the differing levels of maturity of the marine uh, industries, and their existing regulatory frameworks, and the consultation feedback to date, it is essential that there is as much consistency across all the sectors as possible. The general principles are, in the main, robust and set out a clear framework for the future. An example of this is Gen 5 on climate change. I quote, marine planners and decision makers must act in the best way calculated to mitigate and adapt to climate change. It must be acknowledged that the Scottish Government does not, however, pr prioritise any one sector over another. While it is essential in respect to the contribution made to our economy by all marine sectors and the jobs that, that they provide, that there is a tension that must be recognised in Gen 5 as we address the challenges of moving towards a low-carbon economy. Further, in the words of Lucy Greenhill from the Scottish Association of Marine Science, as far as climate change is concerned, we have highlighted there seems to be a poor balance between adaptation to climate change and its mitigation. And this in, in relation to the oil and gas industry. She goes on, the need to look at the different temporal scales on which effects are elicited on the environment, either at the protected area or the species level or at the climate change level. And that is something I want to emphasise. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to ensure this issue is carefully assessed as the plan develops. There's another general policy which I think it's necessary to focus on, and that is number nine on the natural environment. This states, development and use of the marine environment must protect and, where appropriate, enhance the health of a marine environment. As we are all keenly aware, some of our marine environment is in a poor state of health, in need of recovery, some is even denuded. It would be very helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could outline now, or in his closing remarks, whether he is considering further guidance to developers on enhancement. Uh, 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 the, there's, a pro there's a proposal from Environment Link that a further gen in this section would be possible, and Scottish Labour supports this. And that is that sustainable developments and marine activities which provide protection and enhancement of the health of the area and which further marine biodiversity um, is, is helped by are encouraged. In relation to support for existing activity, I want to emphasise, as the committee did, that this must be sustainable. And the Scottish Fishermen's Federation raised concerns in this regard. The draft plan highlights the potential also for the growth within the aquaculture industry. The demand for seafood is increasing as wild catch resources diminish, and so the weight of food security falls heavier on the fish farming business. Increased Scottish aquaculture would provide thousands of jobs, further Scottish exports, and contribute to the upkeep of community services. And the Scottish government, government has, of course, set targets of an increase of 50% of aquaculture production by 2020 though I acknowledge that a good deal of this has been met. These targets have been included in the draft plan, 
And the key word has to be sustainable. Environmental limits must be rigorously adhered to, or the environment will once again play, pay the price for industry growth. Can the Cabinet Secretary reassure us that there will be sufficient scientific research and expertise in place to monitor this increase? If the N NMP is to function as a working document, it must be aware of and reactive to uh, in, in the environmental changes as they arise. We also finally have the first marine protected areas, which is a great relief to all across all sectors and the environment movement. And my colleague Sarah Boyack will address whether these are robust enough in, in our view. Strategically, Scottish Labour is clear that while it is important to ensure that any modifications are included, the overriding aim must be now, as the Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged, that the National Marine Plan be published without more delays. There is, of course, a tension here, but what is needed now is the plan. This can then be added to and built on. The GSI system, Marine Plan Interactive, must enable the plan to become a living document which stakeholders can contribute to and decision makers will refer to. For instance, RSPB have new data on seabird foraging trips to help them inform marine planning. This can be added in. And all the in industry sectors have a responsibility to contribute to this process. Science has an essential role to play, and evidence can come from such a wide range of sources. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation makes a strong contribution here. And citizen science will also have an increasingly vital role to play. The Scottish Marine Science Strategy will be key in drawing all this together. Can the Cabinet Secretary reassure the Chamber that there will be adequate funding for this? And I, and I note his comment today that there is ongoing funding, of course, for, for this area of science. I want to turn now to the regional marine plans and the planning partnerships. Voluntary organisations and inshore fisheries have a strong part to play, such as the Solway Partnership in my own region and so do local authorities. In his letter to the committee, the Cabinet Secretary explained that a phased approach will be taken, as he highlighted today, and this would be in part, and I quote again, to help ensure that appropriate support is not spread too thin. It is reassuring that local authorities will continue to be represented on the Marine Strategy Forum. However, training for assessment and monitoring of developments and conflict resolution when the marine planning partnerships come into place is still a significant challenge. Assessment of cumulative effect will also be vital. And will some form of prioritisation by the Scottish Government become necessary as the years go on? Can the Cabinet Secretary say any more about support for training in local authorities in his closing remarks? Clarity is needed from the Scottish Government about when the review will be and what the process is for public and stakeholder engagement, and Scottish Labour looks forward to the time in the future when the Marine Plan will be laid before this Parliament and acknowledges the commitment of the, of the Cabinet Secretary to take the opportunity to make the statement to Parliament, providing an opportunity for final questioning. Scottish Labour, and as a member of the committee, uh, also wishes all well as we move forward towards the adoption of the National Marine Plan is indeed a delicate balance in the words of the Cabinet Secretary and one that so many want to make sure will work for the future of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alex Ferguson to speak to and move Amendment 12343.1 around six minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, no one from these benches, and I'm sure from any other, uh, will argue that with the overall statement in the motion before us that the general policies in the draft National Marine Plan provide an important framework to deliver the sustainable development of Scotland's seas. They do. And the opening paragraph of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee's report, as Claudia Beamish has already referred to, uh, acknowledges that fact absolutely. But in what I think is a first for this session of Parliament, the Committee's unanimous report was quite critical of certain aspects of the draft plan. And I think that that needs to be recognised uh, in the motion that we're debating this afternoon. I think they certainly would have been if this had been a committed debate as was originally envisaged. And that's why we seek to, uh, to amend the motion just very slightly uh, this afternoon to highlight the committee's position. 
However you try to word it, presiding officer, the committee has been quite hard-hitting and critical of the draft plan. Indeed, in one of the lighter moments of our deliberations, an interesting clerical typo was that the, the original draft of our report actually referred to the daft plan rather than the draft plan. And I have to admit there was a momentary thought within the committee that perhaps we should leave it uncorrected. But more seriously, I'm, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in welcoming the fact that the Marine Plan and our deliberations uh, of it have been completely devoid of any party political divisions. The future sustainability of our marine environment is surely way beyond that. But I would also hope that as a result of that, the government would take our constructive criticisms in the manner in which they're intended. These are not criticisms for criticism's sake or to for party political point scoring. They are made with a view to producing a plan that is clear, concise and easily understood by those to whom it applies. So I remain a little concerned when the committee states that the National Marine Plan is both too detailed and prescriptive in parts and yet too vague in others, that the Cabinet Secretary's response is just, I believe the plan provides a clear overarching framework. I remain a little concerned that the Cabinet Secretary's response to the Committee's criticism that the draft plan does not provide a clear and concise set of principles that can be consistently applied by decision makers is, I believe, the approach is proportionate given the existence of the Marine Policy Statement and the inclusion of a limited range of general policies. And I remain a little concerned when the committee states it has serious concerns as to whether local authorities have the sufficient experience, expertise and resources to successfully develop and implement regional marine plans to which the government's response is the significant expertise in some areas which partnerships will be able to access. I do acknowledge the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged in his contribution that further support and work will need to be done in this area. I could go on, presiding officer, but you will have got the picture. The committee has raised a series of genuine <coughs> questions relating to the draft plan and they need to be taken with the utmost seriousness by the government if this plan is to provide the ultimate guidance to decision makers and users within Scotland's marine environment that it sets out to be. And if it can achieve that aim, then it will be a document of enormous importance and value. But I do believe it has to remain focused on that principal purpose. I believe that it's been in danger of losing that focus and that somewhere in the long process, and this has been a huge body of work, but in that long process of developing the plan, it's been in danger of losing its way, of losing sight of exactly who this plan is for. Having a national marine plan is entirely commendable, useful and desirable. But when we get into the detail of what activity is being undertaken here, and I see that we're endeavouring to give indications nationally and create regional marine plans locally, I think we are in danger of creating a cat's cradle of regulation and guidance. Now, those are not my words, presiding officer. They're the words of Michael Russell during evidence taking within the committee. I can assure the chamber I have his permission to quote him. Um, he then went on to ask what was happening to ensure that the plan would be a simple framework for decision making and not produce some unconscious move towards the accrual of all sorts of prescriptive powers that will make development, living and activity much more difficult. A simple overarching framework for decision making. That is surely the very heart of what this plan should be about. But it isn't simple and it has gone way beyond being overarching as well. Presiding officers, there is a great deal that is very good within the plan, in particular the emphasis on sustainability that is at the very core of it. The establishment of NMPI, as has already been said, as the main portal for special data relevant to marine planning is a, is a, a great innovation. And as I started out by saying, the, the, the general principle of adopting the National Marine Plan uh, is absolutely right and proper. So it's surely all the more important, therefore, to make sure that our National Marine Plan becomes a guidebook that is regularly taken off the shelf to be consulted and used, rather than a potential cat's cradle of regulation that steadily gathers dust while remaining resolutely on the shelf. It's in all our interest that it should be the former presiding officer. And that's what the committee's concerns were aimed at, ensuring that the end product of this very considerable body of work is a national marine plan which will be of benefit to the whole country. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes. 
And I call Rob Gibson to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the scrutiny of the National Marine Plan uh, has uh, raised from our committee quite a lot of uh, criticisms. They're not intended to be ones that say this is not fit for purpose, but it's not fit for purpose yet. And uh, we know that it's taken five years to develop uh, so far. We recognise it's the first one that there's been of a national plan, and we very much welcome the efforts that have been made by uh, the officials and Marine Scotland to get something that's a workable document. But I think between myself and my colleagues, uh, we'll be able to show some of the ways in which it become, uh, could become a more workable uh, document. The Scottish Government's draft plan, you know, can have the danger uh, in its present form of creating conflict by having highly prescriptive actions in some areas while setting out vague aspirations in others. Simply put, instead of making the marine environment easier, it risks making it more difficult. And uh, that was the overall view of our committee, and it's one which I think you know, we need to take seriously. And uh, looking at the marine plan and how uh, it points to the problem that this generates, uh, you look at Gen 4 on coexistence, you can see in the statement there uh, a whole lot of uh, concerns about the ways in which different sectors should work together. Now, the whole point about a national marine plan is that it's able to give guidance to more local bodies that have to deal with this, but also to provide a clear agreement about how each of these competing interests will work together. Now, in the case of uh, uh, where I represent, the Highland Council has got uh, responsibility for three different marine plans. One, the West Highland Marine Region from uh, Ardnamurrican North to uh, Cape Wrath, the North Coast along to Duncan's Bay Head, and then it has to work with two other authorities, uh, Murray and Aberdeenshire, to deal with the area from Duncan's Bay Head to Fraserburgh. So it is going to have a huge task ahead of it. And it's also been our evidence to show that uh, officials and councillors in the Highland Council do not believe that their planning departments have the skills at this time to be able to carry through the work that's expected of them because they will share the largest burden of that work. So it's important for us to highlight these facts just now and knowing in th that we live in times of uh, straightened circumstances for money for local authorities, we have to then pose the question, how do we proceed? Well, partly we've got to take the precautionary principle, but also we've got to encourage people who want to go further and faster at a local level. And uh, that's what I wanted to concentrate a bit on just now, because we know we've had uh, the successful application, as far as I know, of the several order around Shetland for the last 10 years, something which is going to be looked at carefully, I guess, in the near future. We have instigated the no-take zone in Lamlash Bay, and we have groups such as Sea Change around Loch Broom who want to make sure that the marine protected area in that area uh, is not one which is held back in the process of the development of these plans. And the problem we have is that if we're waiting for the Highland Council to set up uh, the West Highland Marine Region, what happens in the meantime? to people who know in common sense terms that they could do much more to be able to improve the habitat of the area that they represent for the benefit of fishing, for the benefit of the regeneration of uh, the area uh, and the seabed and for all the benefits that uh, tourism and visitors can have to that. What are they going to do in the meantime? Well, I understand that Sea Change are about to put a petition to the Scottish Parliament to try and discuss this specific matter about how they move forward. And I'm sure there'll be other people around Scotland who will also have this impatience about being able to make progress and actually do more. At the present time, uh, what uh, Sea Change are saying is that they hope to foster relationships between fishermen and scientists, environment groups and representatives of the public to build a model of best practice which fits local needs, thus pioneering a modern approach which includes ongoing education of the public, but equally by both fishermen and scientists working together in encouraging greater understanding to achieve common goals. Those ideas are embodied in the National Marine Plan, without a doubt. 
But with the uh, evidence here of people saying that there has to be different models tried, and we know that there are pilot schemes in the Clyde and around Shetland at the present time, but we need to be encouraging people to do that. So if we're short of money, we need to take the precautionary principle in some cases, and that's why uh, folk around Loch Broom are saying there are certain aspects of fishing, such as scallop dredging, that's going to have to be curtailed as part of the process of reaching a balance again in nature. And that's the kind of thing which the National Marine Plan has to take into account. Now, I could talk about many of these things, and my colleagues will talk about many others, but the exact model that's developed may be different in each area. However, given our focus on very local matters, we, it would be appalling if we lost the whole of the habitat of the Minch, because, as the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary says, the Marine Coast Guard Agency tug is taken away from that area or even near that area by Easter next year. Isn't it appalling that because uh, we are beholden to a, a scheme from the UK government that the Scottish responsibility for the M MCA is something which needs to take place quickly, but we need to sort out the question of the tug because the grounding at Ardnamurachan is just another example of the fact that around our seas, the potential to destroy vast amounts of habitat are something that very local uh, groups cannot stop, but that we do need a National Marine Plan effectively to deal with those matters. Thank you. I call Margaret McDougall to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this opportunity to speak in this debate on our National Marine Plan. These plans have been drafted to be consistent with the UK Marine Policy Statement, in which UK administrations share a common vision of having clean, healthy, safe, productive and biologically diverse oceans and seas. I have a keen interest in Scotland's National Marine Plan, as my region is dominated by coastal areas and includes both Arran and the Cumbries, as well as the Clyde. With this in mind, I am going to focus my speech on the work of the Community of Arran Seabed Trust, known as COAST, and relate this back to the draft National Marine Plan policy. COAST was created in 1995 with the aim of working for the protection and restoration of the marine environment around Arran and the Clyde. Since then, they have become one of the UK's leading community marine conservation organisations and were responsible for the establishment of Scotland's first no-take zone in Lamlash Bay, which I have highlighted in this chamber previously. They are now campaigning for the complete exclusion of trawlers and dredgers from the newly designated South Arran Marine Protected Area. Coast currently have some concerns over the National Marine Plan, and I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary addresses these today. They are concerned that smaller organisations and coastal communities' views are not being listened to. They feel bigger groups such as the Fishermen's Federation, the oil and gas industry and others have a disproportionate level of input into Marine Scotland, which they argue is far too centralised and needs more bottom-up initiatives and less dictation. In Coast's view, coastal communities get no say over the waters that surround them. So how will the new local level regional marine plans be developed to ensure that both coastal communities and smaller organisations are able to have input into them. While I note that they will take account of local circumstances, we need to ensure those in local areas have an input. The Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee's scrutiny suggests that the current draft of the Marine Plan fails to give sufficient guidance to local authorities on development of regional plans, and that many local authorities won't have the experience, expertise or resources to develop and implement these regional plans. This is also an issue highlighted by Scottish Environment Link, who argue that, and I quote, the emergent marine planning partnerships, the mechanism by which regional marine planning is to be delivered, will require secure funding to ensure evidence-based adaptive decision-making via stakeholder participation." End quote. 
While I accept Marine Scotland will take a lead and feed into this process in developing expertise and sharing good practice, I wonder if this would be an ideal opportunity to get organisations such as Coast and our coastal communities involved in the process, allowing them to work with local authorities so the regional plans can be fed into and are created using an evidence-based approach, which is currently not reflected through the draft marine plan. In relation to a consistent evidence-based approach, Scottish Environment Link and other stakeholders are also concerned about what actually constitutes good environmental status. This was highlighted in the Rural Affairs Committee scrutiny, which points out, as I mentioned earlier, that the plan doesn't contain sufficient guidance for local authorities and that the document does not provide a clear and concise set of principles that can be consistently applied. It's not enough for the plan to have vague aspirations. We need clear and consistent policy and indicators, not only so the regional plans can be implemented, but so they can work collaboratively. Having clear indicators would also allow us to monitor, evaluate and report on the plans. So I agree with the committee's recommendations that the Scottish Government should revisit the document with a view to streamlining the information provided. To conclude, presiding officer, we need to ensure that the draft National Marine Plan is robust, consistent and adopts a strong scientific approach. I hope that the Scottish Government will take on board the concerns raised by the RACI committee, as well as those raised by outside stakeholders. Finally, we need to make sure sufficient resources and funding are made available to those who are expected to, to deliver regional marine plans and that the guidance on these plans are clear and concise so there is no conflict between different regional plans. Because, as we all know, the seas know no boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a little bit of time in hand if members take interventions. Graham Day to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, pivotal to successful delivery of the Marine Plan, both in the national and local context, will, I think, be the points covered in paragraph 43 of the Committee's report. Paragraph 43 notes the role of Marine Scotland in providing advice on conflict resolution between different sectors and intervening in such circumstances as required. More importantly, it sees the Committee call on Marine Scotland to be proactive in engaging with local authorities and relevant others to ensure that they are aware of the support available. Proactive engagement, both in this regard and that of the general expertise that can be called upon, is going to be essential when it comes to local authorities, uh, because there has to be a concern that some, at least, are not that well equipped to develop the regional plans as they will need to be. COSLA, in fact, advised the committee that it holds no central data on the level of ex experience and expertise in marine planning across the 32 authorities. And a conversation with a senior official of my own council regarding available and appropriate expertise for this did nothing to ease my own concerns as to how well placed those charged with drawing up a plan for the area that I represent may, as things stand, be. And I would hope that, despite the best, perhaps more accurately, worst efforts of the Westminster Government and the RSPB, we will ultimately have offshore wind developments to factor into consideration along the Angus coast, along with inshore fisheries, recreational angling, the activities of a commercial port, and with the dredging that that requires, etc. etc. So Claudia Beamish. I thank the member for uh, taking a brief intervention and would just highlight that it's, it's possible, in my view, that if um, uh, the marine plan hadn't been delayed so much, and I understand the reasons for that delay, but if it hadn't been delayed so much that possibly we wouldn't be in the situation we are now with um, the judicial review. I just make that point. It, it's a point of view, but the fact is that a very significant series of offshore, uh, critical offshore developments are under threat because of that. Um, so I, Appropriate expertise and support will be critical, and as the Cabinet Secretary himself has acknowledged, a significant amount of effort will be required to build up the necessary expertise at local level. Therefore, his commitment during evidence to the Committee, reinforcing his response to our report that Marine Scotland would be taking the lead in ensuring that best practice and expertise shared across Scotland 
Followed as it has been by an explanation of the support being provided, the preparation of the first marine planning partnerships in Shetland and Quay is welcome. Clearly, this whole process, shaping the national plan and then working up 11 regional plans, is, and for some time to come, will be a work in progress. Indeed, the Cabinet Secretary admitting an, admitted an evidence in terms of the completing the jigsaw of regional plans that we're talking in terms of quite a few years. And I think that is appropriate, as it's important that we get this right. That said, with, with work supported by Marine Scotland, SNH and SEPA, amongst others, already going on with regard to the pre-marine plan development phase for Shetland and Clyde, then the opportunity should be there relatively quickly to identify any sticking points that might arise and what should be included in the plan that perhaps wasn't featuring in initial thinking. So it ought to be possible to establish a solid foundation relatively soon, although I understand entirely the point the uh, Cabinet Secretary made about not spreading the kind of support which will be required too thinly. But, Presiding Officer, in terms of making progress and calling upon available expertise, can I suggest that in seeking to equip those local authorities lacking a full understanding of all relevant aspects of the marine environment, we should be encouraging dialogue, even informal dialogue, with local RNLI stations, both during consultation and development phases. On a visit to the Arbroath RNLI station earlier this week, I was struck by the very detailed knowledge of the local marine environment which exists within lifeboat crews. Very often crew members have either been crewing a lifeboat over many, many years or indeed make their living at sea. Either way, they've built up a detailed understanding of navigational channels, local fishing areas and the interactions between recreational boating and commercial uh, vessels and so forth. And chances are, unlike others who gave evidence to the committee, they won't have a vested interest in ensuring local plans, indeed the national plan, perhaps take a particular direction. It strikes me it would be crazy for those charged with shaping the regional plans not to sit down with the RNLI volunteers and seek their input as we seek to draw up plans which is well as fitting in with the overarching national strategy accurately reflect local circumstance. And of course, any relevant data which comes to the fore and which isn't already included in the National Marine Plan Interactive could then be fed into that. In paragraph 71 of the committee's report, we recommended, uh, we talked of the need to encourage use of the information contained within the NPI for the purpose of developing the regional plans. But we also called for all relevant data held by local authorities to be fed in. In hindsight, we perhaps ought to have added a line somewhere in the report stressing the need for councils to tap into local expertise to ensure this whole process is fully informed as it might be, so that the NPI becomes a single first-class authoritative mapping source for Scotland's marine areas that that we would all want it to be. Well, one would hope that will happen anyway. Presiding officer, uh, 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 as we stated in the committee's report, as Claudia Beamish touched upon, um, the marine plan do does require amendment to make it fully fit for purpose. And as we've heard, the members would stand by the, uh, that observation, certainly as an observation at that time. However, in light of the Cabinet Secretary's formal response to the report and his comments today, I, I do think we're making some progress. So Richard Lockhead's commitment to review the text of the plan to ensure the relationship between the general and sectoral policies is best representative and that the engagement of Marine Scotland with local authorities will be proactive are examples of this. As too is the fact we're already seeing movement in developing the plans for Shetland and Clyde. And the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, of course, in his opening remarks that he's open to making further changes. But it's worth pausing for a moment to consider the scale of what's being taken on here. The plan and its regional subsets has to take into consideration 900 islands, around 6,500 species, aquaculture, the interaction between fishing and subsea cables, navigational channels, areas for depositing the consequences of dredging, and so on and so forth. It must balance the promotion of economic activity whilst ensuring that that activity takes place in a sustainable manner that not only protects but enhances the natural marine environment. And it must, of course, provide a clear steer on consistency whilst allowing for local flexibility. So let's recognise both the importance of this plan and the fact that, as I mentioned, it is an understandably still a work in progress and will be so for some time to come. To which end, I am sure, the successor to the current RACI committee will, in due course, return to the subject to monitor the progress that is being made. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Tavish Scott to be followed by Dave Thompson. Much, uh, presiding officer. Can I firstly start by uh, agreeing with Graeme Day's point about the RNLI expertise? Uh, I would absolutely share that view uh, in terms of the expertise in uh, Lerwick and Eighth in my own uh, constituency. Uh, and I also agree broadly with Rob, Gib uh, Rob Gibson and the Minister's points about emergency towing vessels that I uh, uh, very much accord, possibly not with the rhetoric, but certainly with the principle of, of the positions that they were outlining. Uh, I absolutely agree with the Minister on, on the Crown Estate as well. Uh, my best on that is uh, implement Smith, because I think Smith has it uh, uh, absolutely. 
absolutely uh, right. Uh, I wanted to come at this debate from the, from the perspective, presiding officer, of the government's food and drink strategy, which I entirely agree with. It's worth £13 billion a year to the economy, and Scotland's seas contribute some £2 billion uh, to that overall figure. Fish, salmon, mussels and prawns are all consumed on the nation's dinner tables and, of course, exported across the world. So a starting point, presiding officer, for a marine plan is does it help these businesses achieve the government's own target to grow our food exports and, of course, eat more healthily? Frankie's Fish and Chip Shop in Shetland is the best in the UK. Indeed, the Cabinet Secretary has eaten there. Uh, they source fish from Shetland boats landing in the islands. Uh, the sea fish industry in Shetland, the seafood industry in Shetland, is worth £300 million to our local economy. Now, that, in fairness, is far higher than oil and gas. So, how does the plan help these industries and that business? Salmon farmers, the salmon industry is under huge regulatory pressure, much of course created here in Scotland, yet they are expected to deliver on a 50% growth target set by the government. How does the plan help them? Seabird numbers fluctuate, as Claudia Beamish and others have already mentioned. Food sources, sea temperature changes and other pressures all affect one of Scotland's most glorious images, gannets diving on shoals of fish close in by the coastline. I can see that uh, out of my window at home in Bressy Sound. I've seen it on the west coast of Scotland and indeed in the Firth of Forth. So how does the plan deal with the changes and the fluctuations in seabird numbers? The renewables industry is this government's closest idea to an industrial strategy. Offshore wind that uh, Graeme Day has already mentioned, tidal and wave, can keep the lights on by producing green power. Wave, as Liam MacArthur's debate showed last night, is under real pressure with commercial firms going bust. So how does this plan help those emerging technologies? And that, presiding officer, is my point. Governments, of course, relish plans, consultations, strategies and the rest of it. Yet plans have to achieve something. They cannot just be top down. Ask Orkney Islands Council, who want a 10-year moratorium on marine designations set to be implemented by the Scottish Government. An approach that brings local people, industries, science and environmental bodies together has to be the practical way forward. A one-size-fits-all, top-down, bureaucratic approach simply will not work. Now, I believe the Cabinet Secretary absolutely knows that. His marine plan, as has already been mentioned this afternoon has two areas, Clyde and Shetland, uh, already uh, with a regional plan. Now, for some, this obviously is new, but not in truth for Shetland. We have had marine planning around the coast since the 1974 ZCC Act, which gave the islands control over works licences. These were the basis for the Sudan oil terminal and the subsequent oil agreements. The Scottish Parliament passed the inshore regulating order in 2000, devolving local management over inshore fisheries. Shetland produced its first marine spatial plan in 2006. We have more experience of this than any other part of the country. Under the uh, Government's timetable, it will be 2016 before a regional marine plan is formally in place in Shetland. I guess the Clyde will take a little longer given the number of local authorities that are involved. So none of this, in truth, is quick. But our experience in the islands of marine spatial planning is simple. Have all the people affected sit around one table and work on the way uh, forward. Offshore renewables developers like the clarity and use the Shetland Marine Spatial Plan. It tells them what they need to know. It tells them the areas to avoid. It saves them time and money. And I hope that approach will work in regional plans right around the coast of Scotland. It helps marine planners integrate terrestrial and marine planning, the very correct aim of the government in this area. Even salmon farmers, or in our case the Norwegians, know where an application uh, to increase production is more likely to be agreed than less so. These are the positive aspects of any agreed marine local plan. But underpinning that plan has to be good science, data collection, verification and the constant updating of information. Now, I feel a bit for Marine Scotland because I see in the government's budget this year that their, their own budget is being reduced by 3% in the next uh, financial year. And that yet they're under pretty some enormous pressure from all of us who want to see more uh, effort in marine science. 
they can, of course, uh, enter more working partnerships with marine research institutions around Scotland, making sure that regional plans are based solidly on evidence. And I suggest the Minister looks at increasing, for example, the Fisheries Industry Science Alliance funding from the current £150,000 a year and turning it into three-year funding allocations, which help projects become much more effective than just annual projects. In Shetland, the North Atlantic Fisheries College staff work with whitefish skippers to monitor landings and records. That keeps the figures and the evidence up to date. So the marine plan changes or should change based on real-time evidence, a point that a number of colleagues have made this afternoon. It has to be a live working document, not one that gathers dust, as Alec Ferguson rightly said, on any academic shelf. My plea in supporting the Minister's approach here is not to listen to the clarion calls that everything must be driven from the top. Regional plans will frankly be worthless if they're all the same. They of course will be different, never mind between Shetland and the Clyde or between Graham Day's constituency on the, on the east coast of Scotland. Also to invest in science and, ev and evidence and to do that in a coherent and long-term manner. And also agree, I thought interestingly, with the case made in today's Press and Journal for the Scottish Seafood Association to be on the Scottish Food uh, Commission. Uh, uh, a, a policy that, and an approach that I agree with the Minister, but I hope he might have another look at the membership of that. I very much, in, in winding up, signing off, so agree with the Government's approach to Scotland's food and drink industry. Seafood and sea fish is an Im enormously important part of this, and my test of this plan will be how it helps to develop an industry which can be an increasing part of that overall approach, so that it, it flourishes in the context of sustainable development, but does so that in supporting the local economy and local people. Many thanks. And I now call Dave Thompson to be followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I too welcome the principle of the Scottish Government adopting a national marine plan uh, to provide guidance to decision makers and users within Scotland's marine environment. Mr Thompson, could I ask you to move your microphone slightly towards you? We're having some difficulty hearing you. Thank okay. you. <clears throat> I could shout, but I better not. Is that better now? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll start again so you can hear the, the, the whole thrust of the wisdom of my words. Uh, I welcome the principle of the Scottish Government adopting a national marine plan to provide guidance to decision makers and users within Scotland's marine environment. The draft NMP's vision for the marine environment is one that strives to ensure clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse seas managed to meet the long-term needs of nature and people. Now, this is admirable, and I congratulate the Government for their work so far. At this point, I would uh, like to mention the grounding of the ship uh, uh, on uh, Ardna Merkin Point near, near uh, Kilhoan in my constituency, which the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier on, and one or two other speakers have also mentioned. Fortunately, the, the crew of the ship are safe. Uh, there's a little apparent uh, pollution, and uh, it looks as if they're going to be able to get her uh, off the rocks all right. But what it does do, as the Cabinet Secretary says, highlights the need for a tug on the West Coast. We're vulnerable at present. We might not be so lucky the next time. And whilst Tavish Scott says he agrees with the principle of the tugs, but not the rhetoric that he has heard, I would just remind him that I agree with the principle and the, the reality. It is the Conservative Liberal Government that is presiding over a situation where we only have one tug based up in Shetland, when everyone with any sense knows that we need two and we need one on the minch. So I would hope Tavish would support that in a much stronger way than he has done up until now. The Marine Plan is primarily designed to protect Scotland's sustainable future. Now, this is great, as I would not support activities that were to be the, to the detriment of our natural heritage. But we must also safeguard the livelihoods of those in our coastal communities. The feeling of the Rural Affairs and Climate Change Committee, the Rocky Committee, of which I am a member, is that the Government must ensure, as the plan develops, that appropriate safeguards are put into place to ensure that rights responsibilities are outlined clearly, but without being too highly restrictive in nature. I would also endorse the comments by my colleagues on the committee about our concerns, which I am sure the Cabinet Secretary was and will and indeed is uh, addressing. In particular, I would urge him to make sure that the regional marine planning is married properly with the national plan, as some other speakers have said, and that relevant guidance is given to local authorities who must also be adequately resourced. And uh, as I say, the Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged this in his opening speech, and for that I am grateful. 
It is good news that after initial reservations, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation are much more satisfied uh, than they were initially uh, in relation to the, the, the plans. They believe that most of their concerns have been addressed and they are now, now much happier with it. I am, of course, very supportive of sustainable fishing activities in our waters and our fishing fleets are major users of the marine environment with a vital role to play economically and socially in Scotland. However, this must be balanced against environmental protection. I do have some reservations on scallop dredging. My feeling is that there should and need to be safeguards uh, put in place. And I'm pleased that the three scallopers who are members of the Malig and Northwest Fishermen's Association, who also contributed to the consultation, are fairly relaxed about the consequences for their businesses of the plan. And with their vast experience in mind, that puts me at some ease. They are relaxed about the NMP so long as there is suitable impact assessment applied to any detailed proposals which come forward in relation to their sector uh, of the industry. There has been uh, some concern about the inclusion of targets for growth of aquaculture within the planning policies. Uh, these targets must, of course, be subject to strategic environmental assessment and habitat regulation assessment to ensure that the level of growth can be achieved within environmental limits. And although climate change impacts are noted for every other sector in the plan, there is no mention of the climate change impacts of the, on the, of the oil and gas sector, which is not in keeping with the government's commitment to reduce the carbon footprint. As the Raki Committee has noted, and other speakers have said, and I have already alluded to, local authorities are currently not equipped to deliver marine planning effectively, and this must be addressed as a matter of uh, urgency. And as I say, I'm pleased the Cabinet Secretary has expressed his willingness to do that. Regional marine planning and the governance of the decision-making bodies which are required for delivering the plans must be well resourced, as this will, will, will facilitate efficiency and streamlined management at both regional and national level. Scottish Environment Link, uh, which uh, was also mentioned, I think, by Claudia Beamish, um, you know, who also take the same view, uh, is the Forum for Scotland's Voluntary Environment Communi Community, with over 35 member bodies who represent a broad spectrum of environmental interest. And Link aims to ensure the environment is fully recognised in the development of policy and legislation affecting Scotland. They have a common goal with Raki and indeed the Scottish Government, which is the aim of contributing to more environmentally sustainable society, which I support. Finally, Presiding Officer, I would like to insist that the Cabinet Secretary make sure that the final plan is effectively monitored and assessed. On that basis, I would recommend that the Government does revisit the document with a view to streamlining the information provided. This will ensure that the final National Marine Plan stands as a clear overarching framework uh, for decision makers that can be applied evenly across the country. I also echo the call comments of my colleagues in the Raki Committee that the online interactive version of the plan which is to be established should be a first class authoritative source for all of Scotland's marine areas. This will keep arrangements fluid between regional and national bodies, enhance accessibility for all concerned and engender the trust of the general public too. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Elaine Murray to be followed by Michael Russell. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by apologising to the Cabinet Secretary for not being present at the beginning of this speech, but I'm a, a member of the Justice uh, Subcommittee on Policing who are taking some evidence which I think is of some interest to, to the Parliament and to the Government. So um, my apologies for not being here. Of course, my focus in this debate uh, on the National Marine Plan, unsurprisingly, uh, rests around uh, the Solway and regional planning for that sea. Uh, the Solway has been rightly proposed as one of the 11 Scottish marine regions, but it does differ uh, from most of the others, not only in crossing the Scottish-English border, but also being in close proximity to the Isle of Man uh, and Northern Ireland, which also have their own marine legislation and management. The English side of the Solway is regulated by the UK Marine and Coastal Access Act and the Scottish side by the Marine Scotland Act. And although there are many similarities between the two pieces of legislation, there are also differences. But despite this, there was a strong feeling that the Solway Firth should not be divided for marine planning purposes. 
The Solway Firth Partnership, which I spoke about in Rhoda Grant's members' debate on coastal, Scotland's coastal partnerships in December, led a vigorous campaign to ensure that the area was not divided for planning purposes uh, and that any differences in arrangements should be a help rather than a hindrance to the planning process. Their sustained campaigning on this issue resulted, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, uh, in a joint ministerial statement in 2009 by the UK Minister at the time, Hugh Aranka davis uh, and the Cabinet Secretary committing both governments to a joined-up marine planning process across the border. This agreement uh, included a joint stakeholder consultation and communication between governments through the planning, throughout the planning process, the publication of a single planning document, a seamless approach to marine spatial planning for the Solway Firth, and clear articulation on how the two planning regimes interact and integrate. So it is not surprising, I don't think, that the, at the end of last year, the Solway was chosen as a case study by the Celtic Seas Project, identified as being a best practice example of how the co-locational sectoral interaction and transboundary challenges are being addressed, and specifically in the important role of the Solway Firth Partnership plays in ensuring success. The outcome of the first stage of this case study will be presented at a conference uh, in Paris in May, and I don't know whether any members of this chamber might be invited to attend that and hear the results. Other than campaigning for, the, for this always to be treated as one entity, the Solway Firth Partnership does not normally lobby as it has a broad membership in its role. It's normally one of facilitation and mediation between interests. And it didn't, for example, contribute written evidence to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee's inquiry into the draft marine plan. However, when reading the committee's report, it struck me that the experience of the Solway Firth Partnership could be helpful in addressing some of the issues raised by the, uh, by the committee. Paragraph 42, for example, expresses concern about the possibility of inconsistencies between regional marine plans and the need for guidance on how regional marine areas will be expected to work together uh, to ensure that users of the marine environment operating at a national level do not face inconsistency or uh, conflicting arrangements. And it strikes me that a challenge of that nature uh, will be addressed in the Solway because of the different legislative uh, regimes and management arrangements, not just between Scotland and England, but the Island of Man and Northern Ireland too. So there could be some uh, examples of this good practice could actually be applicable across uh, the uh, regional marine plans uh, throughout Scotland. The sectoral interests of the Solway are diverse also. Uh, it supports a diverse mixed fishery, which in turn provides employment in Cumbria and in Fries and Galloway. And as Dave Thompson was speaking, it reminded me of the conflict of interest need, indeed between uh, the hand gatherers of, co of cockles and the dredging for cockles. So there are, are different differences of interest between, even within the same sector or the same areas, there are differences of interest between different uh, uh, proponents of, of different techniques. There are areas, of course, of environmental importance. The estuary is a Ramsar site. The Inner Solway is designated as a special protection area under the EU Birds Directive and as a special area of conservation. The English side of the Solway was designated as an area of outstanding natural beauty back in 1964, and the three national scenic areas were designated on the Scottish side 20 years ago. And the area also uh, includes a number of nat national nature reserves and sites of scientific, special scientific interest. So there is potentially areas for conflict between these interests uh, and with the renewable and energy opportunities in the Solway. And as those of us who were around at the time will know, the 60 turbine Robin Rig offshore wind farm development was contentious on both sides of the Solway. And five years ago, nine possibilities for tidal generation, using, including barrages, lagoons and reefs, were identified in a report commissioned by Scottish Enterprise, North West Regional Development and the Nuclear De Decommissioning Authority. Now, I'm not aware that there has been much progress in any of these pr proposals over the last five, five years. However, undoubtedly, there could be significant environmental consequences, particularly uh, if, uh, if the larger barrage schemes were implemented, these, and these were the ones which were considered uh, the only ones which were commercially viable. So, marine planning in the Solway will be crucial in balancing uh, c competing interests, but also, very importantly, in protecting uh, the marine area and the marine environment. And also, it will be essential, as other, others have said, that local authorities on both sides of the Solway have su sufficient expertise and resource to develop a robust marine planning system for the region. And they need to be able to draw on the expertise of local organisations such as the Solway Firth Partnership. And I note in the Cabinet Secretary's response to the committee report that he acknowledges uh, the that the existing expertise which can be drawn on locally and, and how much th that is. Uh, but to enable local expertise to be best used, the national plan must, as the committee recommends, be clear and concise 
in defining the principles which must be applied without at the same time being prescriptive. And the RACCE committee has been critical of the draft plan, for example, in stating that it is too detailed and prescriptive in parts and yet too vague in other parts. And I note that the Cabinet Secretary has agreed to review the text with regard to the relationship between the general and sec uh, sectoral policies. I would welcome further clarification on what opportunities might be available for scrutiny uh, of any revised plan. I'm afraid you must close. Yeah, presiding officer, the draft national plan has been a long time in its preparation, as we've heard, uh, but the committee's report indicates it still does have some distance to go before it becomes the final uh, plan. Many thanks. And I now call Michael Russell to be followed by Jean Urquhart. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'm glad that the cabinet secretary has at the very outset drawn attention to the ongoing difficulty in the Sound of Mull with the Lysblink Seaway, which is in Mr Thompson's constituency, but within sight of mine. And I shall be on the island of Mull tomorrow, just across from where it is. That uh, uh, grounding is now leaking fuel oil and there is a boom around the ship. Uh, and I'm very pleased that not only the Cabinet Secretary, but also the MP for the West Niles, Angus Brendan McNeill, and the Westminster candidate for Argyll and Butte, Brendan O'Hara, have both drawn attention to exactly the same issue as the Cabinet Secretary has raised, which is that we do require there to be a tug on the West Coast. And if there is not a tug on the West Coast, then incidents like this can only be dealt with more slowly than they would otherwise be dealt with. And that leads to the situation where a small leak yesterday is a larger leak today. It is still not a crisis, but there could be a crisis, and it's very important that the tug is based there. Now, that demonstrates the need for an integrated approach to marine management, and I commend the Cabinet Secretary very strongly for the work he has done with the UK Government to seek that uh, integrated approach. And it's just a pity that in this matter, and some would argue in other matters, the UK is not yet measuring up. This marine plan is undoubtedly a good marine plan. The obligation, however, is uh, on the Scottish Government not to produce just a good marine plan, but to produce the best marine plan it possibly could. And uh, when uh, Graham Day and I met with the Northern Ireland Environment Committee members this morning, we were, I'm sure, impressed by Anna Lowe, the convener of the committee, who said that she thought the work that was done in marine planning by the Scottish Government was exceptional, without doubt the best she thought in the world. But it could, of course, always be better. And Alec Ferguson's uh, uh, view that the marine plan should be clear, concise and easily understood is exactly correct. That is what the plan should aim to be. And I'm very pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed to the committee that further simplification is required and has committed himself in the letter to the committee convener to review the text to consider how the relationship between general and sectoral policies is best represented. I think that will take us a further stage along the road to that best marine plan. If I could, presiding officer, raise three specific points that I think are of importance. The first has been raised by a number of members, but there are two illustrations to it that I think would help members, and that is gaining the expertise um, and the experience in marine planning that local authorities need. Uh, I spoke to Liam MacArthur last night. I'm sorry he's not in the chamber. He knew I was going to raise this about the representations from Orkney Fisheries that some members have received where they believe that there is a lack of expertise in the local authority, which is hindering the work of the local fishing industry. Uh, paradoxically, the opposite position is taken by, in the representations to the committee by our Garland Butte Council, who, who believe that that lack of expertise, which they admit exists, will in actual fact lead to more restrictive planning uh, and actually a restriction on development. Whatever the final outcome, there needs to be uh, careful and strong resourcing of training and the development of expertise in local authorities to allow them to operate the marine plan. Until that is in place, then this plan should not be operating in the regions anticipated. The two pilot regions are working reasonably well. It should not be expanded until that experience is in place. Secondly, there is uh, concern by some people about the process being made in conservation. Uh, in particular, in my own area, the uh, work in the, uh, on the marine protected area for the common skate and the special area of conservation for the harbour porpoise. They both seem to have moved more slowly than they should have done. Northern Ireland has a special area of conservation for the harbour porpoise. Scotland does not yet have one. And it is, as Rob Gibson has, has, has indicated, very important that the, uh, the, the enthusiasm, the impetus from local communities to be involved in those processes and to see conservation take place needs to be uh, supported by government. And the marine plan is the ideal place for that to happen because it gives the framework in which communities can understand the process of conservation, can understand the process of designation, and can make sure that they influence it. And the third issue I know the Cabinet Secretary would expect me to raise is the issue of marine cables. There is a difference between repairing an existing cable 
uh, and replacing that cable and putting in a new cable. And I make that obvious point because of the experience of the people of Isla, Jura, and Colonsay uh, last year, who for six months did not have a working marine cable that brought electricity uh, to their islands. For six months, there was a discussion and debate between Marine Scotland and, and SAC and other parties about how that cable should be replaced. This was an existing cable that had failed. The Marine Plan does still does not make the proper distinction in this matter. The Marine Plan must allow the replacement of cables as an emergency, because these are the ways in which electricity is supplied to remote communities, must allow that replacement to take place speedily. Of course, new cables should be subject to different regulation. And it is important that, where necessary, those cables should be buried. Uh, and I don't think even the, the, the most uh, 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 difficult electricity company would, in the end, resist that. But to stop communities being connected as a result of a failure of a cable, because a state body could not agree with the electricity provider, was the wrong thing to do. And it was a disservice to those rural communities. Those are three issues um, of many issues that the committee discussed. And I was very impressed with the uh, work of my new committee colleagues uh, on this matter. There is a desire to support the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary to make sure that this is the best possible marine plan, and certainly a marine plan that can stand amongst the best in the world. But to do that, it will require simplification and some redrafting. I do remember a senior civil servant saying to me on one occasion, Minister, simplification is a complex business. I think we have a situation here where simplification can be very simple indeed. The committee have given good guidance to the Cabinet Secretary about how to go about it, and I look forward to reading and debating the final version of the plan. Thank you. Final open debate speaker in this debate is Jean Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I too uh, welcome the National Marine Plan as a positive step towards the effective marine spatial planning of the Scottish Sea area. And I acknowledge that while the plan is a work in progress, it does need to be implemented in part, at least to allow regional planners within the 11 regions to manage their natural environment. However, the impact of certain sectors, I feel, have not been addressed within the plan and they could jeopardise the recovery of the marine environment. I feel it is wrong at this time to place targets on the tonnage of finfish to be produced per year, considering the environmental implications of a, of a, of a mismanaged fish farm and we shouldn't pretend that they don't exist. The environmental impacts of these farms can range from internal effects, which may only affect a single cage, or at worst, the whole farm, to those that have repercussions through whole water bodies and ecosystems. Yeah. Effects such as nutrient enrichment, contamination through fish facial matter, increased parasite numbers, and fish SKPs from cages all carry significant risk to wild populations and ecosystems as a whole. Sea lice are of particular concern, and while I understand that this industry contributes towards food security as well as the Scottish economy, the risks I have outlined cannot be taken too lightly. These targets should be subject to rigorous environmental impact assessment, and with the knowledge we now have, presumed against in, area, in some areas of high sensitivity. The lack of climate change mitigation measures within the oil and gas sector is baffling too, considering this sector is probably the most polluting of all. And rather than showing a commitment towards a low carbon economy, the plan seems to promote sector growth of the oil and gas industry. I hope this will be reconsidered. Scotland has uh, climate change targets and the industry needs to be accountable for the damage that it does to the environment. There have been concerns that the 11 marine regions may not be able to cope with the challenge of managing their coastline, whether this be due to funds, lack of expertise or resources. And there must be a cohesive ap approach, I think, from local authorities, environmental groups and local people to deliver the objectives of this plan. I believe that the Raki Committee is correct in its assessment that local authorities are not currently equipped to deal with setting up and monitoring local marine plans. However, development of tools and collaboration between local authorities may ensure that mistakes, if they are made, are not repeated. I believe that the plan needs to be more ambitious in setting targets for not just recovery of the marine environment, but enhancement of it, both outside and inside marine protected areas. Within my constituency lies the Westeros MPA, which has some 
badly damaged mayoral beds in despite uh, these being a prior, despite these being a priority uh, marine feature. The management plan has now become obsolete due to further scientific work carried out on the location of these beds and there have been reported infringements of the voluntary marine area. The National Marine Plan needs to firstly protect and then restore vulnerable areas such as these alongside the marine protected area legislation. In one small comparatively small sea loch in Wester Ross, there is all manner of sea best activity imaginable. Three ferries per day, commercial trawling, fishing, shellfish, scallop divers, shellfish creels, uh, three wrecks attracting divers and merrill beds, sea angling and wildlife boat trips, skiffs, kayaks, canoes, yacht mooring, windsurfing, water skiing, a sailing school, fish farms, and possibly soon to be subsea cabling, visiting cruise liners, and even we girls and boys fishing off the end of the jetty and off the end of the big pier if they get the chance. I think that that kind of activity in our sea locks really merits this kind of management. My concern will be twofold. One, that we do police it properly, and I'm not sure how that's going to be done, but it's essential if it's going to have any effect whatsoever. And the other is possibly the one that at the moment is left perhaps to the creative industries to, to deal with, which is dealing with the, and, and fishermen of course, dealing with the litter in the sea and education for that to change. But I agree with Rob Gibson and Tavish Scott that the local variations of the national plan would be essential and welcome. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Jamie McGregor. Six minutes, please. Um, thank you. Um, I'm pleased to close today's important debate for the Scottish Conservatives. We've had some positive contributions from many members. As Alex Ferguson indicated, the Scottish Conservatives, like parties across this chamber, recognise the vital importance of our marine environment to our bi biodiversity, our economy and our communities. All of us surely can sign up to the vision of the National Marine Plan for clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse seas that are managed to meet the long-term needs of nature and people. The challenge is how to achieve this vision while allowing existing sustainable activities, some of which have gone on for centuries, and the jobs and communities they underpin, to be preserved and indeed enhanced and to avoid complicated or excessive regulation. Unfortunately, as members across the chamber have also said today, we do have real concerns that the current draft plan as it stands simply does not adequately help meet all these aims. Like others, I therefore welcome the thorough and very useful report of the Rural Affairs Committee into the plan which makes important recommendations for significant improvements. And we look to the government to act on these recommendations. I fully agree with the committee's statement that the NMP should provide a simple framework for decision-making and should not unintentionally produce a variety of prescriptive powers which will make operating in the marine environment more difficult. On fishing, I wish to flag up the concerns expressed by Bertie Armstrong of the SFF, who rightly spoke about the need to recognize the existing and sustainable activities of our fishing fleets. These activities, of course, sustain many remote and island communities in my region on the west. Uh, help with, um, they help with food security and they are valuable to our economy. So the NMP should provide the appropriate level of protection for existing sustainable use in the wild fishers industry that our fishermen understandably want to see. And I would also echo the committee's sensible call for the Scottish Government to work with the SFF and our other fisheries, fisheries associations and all other stakeholders to review the fisheries chapter so there can be no contradictions with existing fisheries regulation or confusion in interpretations. Now on fish farming and aquaculture, I've consistently argued for sustainable coexistence between our farmed and wild fish sectors, both of which are so important to the economy in my region and the wider Scottish economy. 
So while it is right that the NMP supports the development of our aquaculture sector, it's also right that it identifies the need for a risk-based approach to the location of fish farms and the potential impacts on wild fish. And I have consistently called for fish farms to be positioned away from river mouths and further out to sea. And I note with interest the committee's discussions on the current precautionary principle in terms of a presumption against aquaculture on the north and, north east, and, and east coasts. One leading aquaculture stakeholder suggested to me only yesterday that this presumption was outdated now and in the not too distant future it may be possible for the industry to have developed the technology that will allow it to be in a position to develop on the north coast. At any rate, I would support the committee's recommendation that the government should review the science and evidence with a view to refining the presumption. The aquaculture industry has had a very bad year and um, I would make the point that a healthy and prosperous aquaculture industry will do far more for conservation than an industry that is hard-pressed and hanging on by its fingertips. Uh, well, yes. Rob Gibson. Uh, to Jamie McGregor. I wonder if you could tell me what, what species you think should be uh, farmed in the north and east coast of Scotland. Jamie McGregor. I think we're talking about... Um, well, we're talking about salmon, Mr. Uh, uh, tell the man, but that, I think that's what they're talking about. Um, farm salmon. Uh, finally, and on behalf of constituents in Isla and Jura, I welcome the fact that there are various serious concerns about the unacceptable delays they faced on restoring the subsea power cable serving their islands. Um, this was mentioned by uh, Mike Russell during which time they had to rely on an ageing generator, are voiced in the committee's report. And I strongly support the calls for there to be a new fast-track approach for these emergency circumstances, uh, which should be detailed in the fi final NMP. I, I received so many um, concerns from people living on Isla and Jura in this respect. And I would like to close by supporting the amendment in Alex Ferguson's name and calling for the government to recognise the significant improvements which are required for the final NMP. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Sarah Boyack, seven minutes or so. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, the Marine Act we passed five years ago was hugely ambitious, and the Marine, Act, Marine Plan which follows it is absolutely crucial five years on. As others have said, it's a framework for decision-making, it's got to be a document that's up to date and reflecting national priorities and policy, but it's also got to provide the good basis for regional and local decision making. And I think that's the context in which the Iraqi committee felt that the plan was currently not fit for purpose. As many have said this afternoon, over prescriptive in some areas, but too vague in others. And I think Rob Gibson uh, ably set out the concerns of the committee. So I very much welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has accepted our amendment this afternoon because we wanted to move on from the Government motion, not to delete it, but to add to it, in particular to reflect the excellent representations that were received in committee evidence, but also to enable us to flag up a couple of issues that weren't covered in the Minister's motion. And in the context of today's debate, I think it has been a really good debate and I think it also reflects the quality of the briefings that I think we've all had in, front of in advance of today's debate, which I think have been extremely helpful. Um, we wanted to flag up the important issue, the central issue of the health of Scotland's seas and the importance of enhancement of recovery and protection. We wanted to note the concerns expressed by the Don't Take the Pee Out of MPAs campaign on marine protected areas and particularly to recognise the significant challenges posed by taking forward the delivery of the plan and of ensuring that there's the capacity at the regional level and the new regional partnerships but also in our local authorities to monitor, to assess developments and to consider the potential cumulative and interconnected impacts of new development. We recognise the importance of the National Marine Plan Interactive to make sure that the national and regional marine plans are living documents. 
And I think for us, the overarching objective has to be sustainable development, recognising the importance of the three legs of sustainable development in terms of environment, social and economic um, interests, but also that issue about being sustainable going forward. And I think for a marine environment, that is the crucial issue. It's not just looking at how things are now, it's thinking to the future, and particularly thinking about adaptation and mitigation in relation to climate change. I think one of the key issues that's been stressed today in the debate is about the capacity, the resourcing and the expertise to make the decisions that will be needed following on from the marine plan. And the key issue about how the regional marine and spatial planning partnerships are going to be able to take forward those bits of the National Marine Plan, which we think um, in the committee are vague. I think the idea of sharing expertise and science from Marine Scotland is absolutely crucial. But I'd observe that if we're thinking about uh, renewables, for example, the time lag of expertise in local authorities on onshore marine took years. It needed extra investment from ministers. And I think there's a huge catch-up agenda that will be needed here <laughs> as marine technologies are changing all the time. But so is the science, so is the knowledge about the impact on our wildlife. So that, that means we have a real challenge in front of us. And I think it's crucial that we get the balance right, whether it's fishing, aquaculture, oil and gas, renewables, transport, leisure industries, or nature interpretation. The interplay between all those different uses is going to be judged, it's going to be decided on, not just by what's in the plan, but by how the regional partnerships and our local authorities get involved. And I think that's why the science base that was mentioned in Tavis's uh, amendment is so important. Science won't make the decisions for us, but it will at least let us weigh up the choices and it will at least let us make more informed decisions. And I think the, the point that Rob Gibson made about the precautionary principle is absolutely crucial. If we're not sure, we can always come back to some of those issues, but we need to make sure we're not making things worse. And I think there were some important issues raised by the Scottish Renewables Briefing. Um, they're concerned that there aren't ad hoc year-on-year -year changes to the National Marine Plan. I understand that concern. It's a concern of stability that was raised by Tavis Scott. But there's also an issue, and we felt this quite strongly as a committee, that we need to be making sure that we do revisit the Marine Plan, not just in five years, but probably in three, given the pace of change and the scale of change that is taking place in our marine environment and in the industries that are active in our marine environment. I think there was a, an important point um, made by RSPB about the fact that national policies must be implemented within safe environmental limits and are supported by robust environmental assessment. And their concern about the lack of an overall assessment of the plan, they believe that that compromises the potential of the plan to deliver. I think from where we are now, that probably makes the assessments on every MPA and every protected area in a marine environment even more important in terms of that environmental assessment. If we are to achieve the clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse seas, and if they are to be managed to meet the long-term needs of nature and people and to live within environmental limits, we really need the knowledge base to do that. And I think that's a key issue because that's a, a relationship between what we need as a society and what the, many of some of our most fragile rural communities need to keep living and to keep growing and also the long-term capacity of our marine environment to be exploited to deliver those jobs and to deliver those economic benefits. That's really why we wanted to flag the concerns of the Don't Take the Protection Out of MPAs campaign. Um, and I think I'd want to echo the comments made both by Claudia Beamish and by Rob Gibson about the need for conflict resolution. In fact, conflict resolution was mentioned by everybody who was talking about the local issues. Um, and I think it's an absolutely crucial issue for us to focus on. I think the points made by Graeme Day, I think the point was made also by Margaret McDougall and by Elaine Murray. And we need to draw on the expertise and experience that is there already. The work that's been done in Shetland and Clyde, that is important. We need to draw that in. But I think we also need to reflect on the fact that we can't wait until those pilots have been done before decisions are taken because of the length of time it's taken to get to the marine plan that are decisions that are needing to be taken across the country. So that makes the local experience, it makes the experience of volunteers and local organisations marine planning partnerships, it makes them hugely important now, not just in the future. And I think 
um, there was a reference made to the work that's been done by Coast, I think by Margaret McDougall. And some of the work that they have, they have done in their submission to the Clyde um, Marine Protection Area, I think, actually begins to highlight some of the win-wins I think Dave Thompson was talking about, about when you have sustainable fisheries, when you have local involvement, when you try and bring together the interests of sustainable fisheries, recreational sea angling, tourism, leisure and other sustainable developments, there are potential win-wins there and the research that they have highlighted in their submission talks about the economic benefits that come from making the most of some of those small-scale but cumulatively important developments. And I think the same point um, was made by Jean Urquhart about how we make sure those opportunities are delivered properly. And I think she made an important point about policing of the process and policing of what people are doing. We need to have that confidence um, that what people um, aspire to do is actually what happens in practice. Um, I think the points made by Elaine Murray about drawing on the expertise across point. boundaries is, a, is an important point, and it's the point I want to finish on, presiding officer. There's a huge amount that's there already that we need to learn on. And if, if there's one thing we need to take forward is the fact that there's knowledge and information there already. The real challenge is making sure that those who will be responsible for marine planning have that knowledge and have that expertise at their fingertips, because that will be the that will be the judge of whether it's a successful process in the end. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Excellent. Many thanks. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until 3.45. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I just add my thanks to all the members from across the Chamber for their contribution to this debate. It's a debate on a first, Scotland's first national marine plan. It's been many years in the making. And whilst we may have improvements to make, I accept that, and that's the whole purpose of the committee's work and laying in a, a draft plan before Parliament for comment. Uh, because this is a first, we'll look back hopefully in a few years' time where it will be taken as a norm that Scotland has a national marine plan uh, and Scotland will move forward and get all the benefits uh, from that. We all support having a thriving marine environment. We all want to safeguard that because of biodiversity reasons, environmental benefits and so on. And of course, at the same time, we want to promote sustainable economic development in our seas, given that the industries that thrive in our seas sustain tens of thousands of jobs onshore and at sea as well. So it's about industries, it's of course also about people, and it's about people who use our seas for work or for leisure. And in that regard, I'd like to join those members who pay tribute to the RNLI in Scotland. Of course, we saw recently they had a record number of call-outs last year and are doing a grand job and, of course, put their own safety in the line often for others. The 2012 Scottish Annual Business Statistics demonstrated that the core marine sector alone is worth £4.5 billion to the Scottish economy, employing nearly 50,000 people. That includes oil and gas services, but not oil and gas extraction, for instance, which of course accounts for more billions of pounds of revenues and thousands more jobs as well. And of course, over and above that, we have our fishing and aquaculture sectors. They're major players, again contributing hundreds of millions of pounds to our economy and safeguarding local jobs, as many members mentioned, in some of the more remote parts of Scotland. And our seas are also providing Scotland with energy and will do so more in the future. 25% of Europe's tidal and offshore wind power and 10% of Europe's wave power can be found in Scottish waters. That is, of course, massive potential. So in many regards, Scotland is a leading player in terms of our seas uh, globally. Stakeholders and others who inputted the process over the last few years played a huge role. I'm glad they do welcome much about where we've got to with the first marine plan. Bertie Armstrong of the SFF said, in general terms, we are pleased with what has come out. The Crown Estate said it provides a good vision for Scotland's seas. The British Ports Association said we very much welcome the document. And also Professor Thomas from the Salmon Producers Organisation said the plan is probably more advanced than those in any other European Union region. And whilst I asked Professor Thompson to take note that Scotland's a nation, not a region, I think he do, does make a fair point uh, generally in his comments. Uh, and of course, the representative of the marine scientists, Lucy Greenhill, said that the main benefit that the marine plan and processes could provide is the ability to assess cumulative impacts across multiple sectors. 
So, despite some of the comments of the need for improvement in some aspects of the plan, the draft plan, which I accept and I'll come on to, generally speaking, the stakeholders who we've worked very closely with over many years have welcomed where we've got to with this plan. There have been many comments about making the plan simpler. And again, I take that on board. And as we prepare to adopt the final plan, we'll see how we can make it more simpler and easier to read and so on. I would simply gently point out that the only plan we have produced in England so far is only one of the regional plans, not even the national plan, which goes to 190 pages. Ours is only 133 pages, and we represent 60% of UK waters. We've got the lion's share of the waters. So I think we accept that there's a lot of detail that has to go into those plans, but we're perhaps more streamlined and simplified already than other parts of these islands. But as I said, we do have an open mind to looking for further improvements to the plan, take seriously many of the comments made by the committee and members uh, speaking today in this debate. There have been a range of issues. The lack of expertise, perhaps, has been highlighted in local authorities to take forward implementation of the plan. Again, that is something we take seriously. I would point out that at the moment we have seven coastal partnerships in Scotland already, and the Scottish Government already funds project officers working on these kinds of issues who work for these coastal partnerships. And as Tavish Scott and others made the point as well, in places like Shetland, which is going to be one of the first two areas for regional planning, I think no one would argue with the idea that Shetland has a lot of expertise in dealing with the kind of issues we are speaking about today. So yes, as the years progress and more regional plans are put in place, we will have to develop the expertise at local level, but there is a lot there already, and we have to just make sure we are using that and bring it together. In terms of conflict resolution, many members mentioned that as well where the issue of should one activity trump another activity, well, clearly it's very difficult to lay down a general rule because you have to look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis. But Marine Scotland will play a, a role of being broker where there is potential conflict at local level. And yes, we will monitor the plan going forward to make sure it's constantly adapted where necessary and it's working. There is a five-year review timescale, as the members are aware. Some members have said that should be reduced to three years. We will consider that, but of course renewable energy and other sectors are saying there should be stability. So we keep on having reviews that could make it less stable, so we have to take their views into account uh, as well. Uh, also in terms of marine features, should we go for enhancement, not just protection of marine features? That is something that is also part of the debate over marine protected areas at the moment, which will also be taken forward as part of the, the Marine Bill uh, in due course. And as the the Chamber knows we have just consulted the management options for the MPAs. Uh, Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that um, the, the enhancement is absolutely vital, um, as I made the point of my speech, in relation to the fact that some areas are denuded, so recovery is not enough really for our marine environment, and that is highlighted in the Act itself? <coughs> Well, as Claudia Beamish knows, our approach is to encourage enhancements of the marine environment where possible, but we have to expect existing activities. So unless there is really strong evidence existing activities are causing significant damage, we have to respect those activities have been there for a long time and should continue. But we should enhance the marine environment, of course, uh, where possible. But in terms of some of the delicate balances which many members have alluded to, I just want to highlight a couple of issues that arose in the debate that perhaps illustrate the challenge facing government in terms of striking that balance. So Margaret McDougall and Rob Gibson spoke about the calls for more fisheries conservation at local level in different parts of Scotland. At the same time, we had the recommendation from the committee saying perhaps we should put more safeguards in for the fishing industry. So it's quite difficult to have it both ways. Therefore, we have to strike a balance because these two positions are incompatible in the eyes of some. So we have to strike a balance. Uh, also, in terms of aquaculture, we had Tavish Scott looking for the plan to promote aquaculture in Shetland. Jean Urquhart said that she did not want to see a target for aquaculture and should take a very precautionary approach. Again, two positions which the plan, I think, does a fairly good job at balancing so we can have a sustainable aquaculture sector uh, developing and sustaining jobs in local communities uh, in the times ahead. I also just want to refer to the fact that this is a marine plan, of course, that does not just go out to 12 miles, which is the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament. Because of the agreement with the UK Government, it goes out to 200 miles, albeit we still await for additional responsibilities, such as control over the, the management of the Crown Estate, and we are seeking confirmation from the UK Government that that will be out to 200 miles and not just 12 miles. But in terms of the 
In fact, it does go out to 200 miles, gives us a whole range of factors we can take into account in planning for the future. So we have to safeguard fishing wherever possible. We also have to have the ability have to have preferred locations for marine renewable developments. We have to look at salmon and migratory species and the impacts they have on their environment and other activities have on their health. We have to look at how we reuse oil and gas infrastructure where possible, particularly in relation to carbon storage and, uh, and carbon capture. So therefore, there's a range of issues we can look at as part of this plan between 12 and 200 miles uh, as well. So I just want to close just by saying that we are entering a new era for marine, the marine environment in Scotland. We are a global player when it comes to the marine sector, our maritime sectors, and the richness of our seas. I outlined in my opening remarks how we've got unique species, we've got offshore renewables potential, we've got the off oil and gas industry, uh, and we've got the fishing industry, uh, and so on. So we're a major global player when it comes to these maritime sectors. Now we're looking at marine protected areas, which will be implemented in Scotland soon to add more conservation to our marine features that lie beneath the waves. We've got inshore fishing groups set up, which looks at local management of fishing. We're looking at regional planning partnerships as part of what we're discussing today with the marine plan. So we're looking at a bottom-up approach, not just simply a top-down approach to a half-time. Yeah, briefly, up. Sarah Blatt. It was particularly in the point about the MPAs. I think one of the concerns that we've had flagged with us is just about the detail of the MPAs and about that balance of protection and sustainable fisheries. Um, will you take a look at that so that we make sure we don't have blanket decisions across those MPAs and we make sure that local concerns are adequately reflected? Uh, yes, as indicated previously, I'm, I'm happy to, to look at that. Uh, finally, if I've got time, I just want to raise the issue others mentioned as well, which I raised in my opening remarks, which is ensuring that we can protect our marine environment and we have the power and the resources to do that. Therefore, it is unacceptable, given the events of the last 24 hours, that in Easter 2016, just over a year's time, we could have no emergency towing vessels based in Scottish waters because the contract for the one vessel we're left with in the Northern Isles will run out in Easter 2016. Given there's been three major incidents involving three major vessels, large vessels, in Scottish waters over the last few months alone, we shouldn't have less emergency towing vessels in Scottish waters. We should have the number we had before restored. We should have our two vessels back in Scottish waters to safeguard Scotland's marine environment and the UK Government should get a grip and deliver that and recognise that they are leaving Scottish seas vulnerable to pollution uh, and other damage. So that is why I am writing to the UK Government asking them to make sure they put the adequate resource into Scottish waters to protect the marine environment. So I believe the marine environment, if we can get all these uh, ducks in a row and will improve and take on board the comments for the, the draft marine plan, will deliver protection for the hundreds of thousands of jobs that depend on Scotland's seas and also deliver protection for Scotland's precious and world-famous marine environment. And I commend the motion to Parliament. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the National Marine Plan and it is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendment, members should have the bill and the marshal list. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes should there be a division on the amendment. The period of voting will be 30 seconds. Also members who wish to speak in the debate on the amendment should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the amendment, which I now do in the name of Gavin Brown. Amendment 1, Mr Brown. Sir, thank you. This amendment reflects concerns raised by a number of councils during the Finance Committee written and verbal evidence. Councils were worried that this legislation and the publicity surrounding it could have a negative impact on the collection of other local government taxes. Seven councils who gave evidence either in writing or verbally to the committee made this point. It was a spread of councils in political terms and geographical terms, and it was raised by councils both who were for the bill and indeed against the bill. In our view, presenting officer, if this turns out to be the case in practice, then the burden to compensate should fall on those who created the situation, in this case the party who brought forward the legislation, central government, as opposed to local government. Presenting officer, I wasn't allowed to go quite as far as that in terms of admissibility of my amendment, so my amendment does, in my view, the next best thing. It creates a legislative obligation on the Scottish Government to monitor the situation 
and to publish the results in a transparent fashion. A specific duty like this allows Parliament and the wider public to judge for themselves the impact of the legislation. If there is to be an impact on the collection of other local government revenues, then in my view it is most likely to happen sooner amid the, amid the publicity of the Act rather than later. Hence, the amendment obliges the Scottish Government to do this only twice, once after six months and once after 12 months. It is, in my view, important to have this amendment in primary legislation, given the mixed messages coming from the Scottish Government. Following a meeting with the then Local Government Minister, Derek Mackay, COSLA understood the position to be that if revenues elsewhere were hit, the Scottish Government and COSLA would be back round the negotiating table sorting the issue out. However, the Deputy First Minister, in giving evidence to the committee, suggested that any hint of compensating councils was off the table. In closing, therefore, Presiding Officer, in my view, there is a risk flowing from the legislation that has been highlighted by many councils. In my view, this risk ought to be monitored closely, and the results of that monitoring should be transparent and should be published. And I therefore move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on the Minister Marco Biaggi. Presiding officer, this amendment, I believe, is laid because of a desire to see the continued health of our local government revenues. And we all in this chamber share the belief that taxes arising should be taxes collected. The money we are paying in council tax is going straight into funding essentials offered by our local councils, whether that is schools, care homes, roads, parks, the list goes on. And keeping those revenues buoyant is already a priority that is closely monitored. Council tax collection rates today stand at 97 per cent. Placing an additional burden on local authorities to provide the specified information to the timescales that Gavin Brown proposes is, I believe, unnecessary and unhelpful. Information on community charge payments is already included in the returns local authorities make to the government on tax collection. The Council Tax Collection Statistics for 2013-14 as well were published by the Scottish Government on Tuesday 17th of June 2014, less than three months after the end of the financial year. The Scottish Government will undertake to report the final community charge collection data to the Finance Committee at the same time as the Council Tax Collection Statistics for 2014-15 are published, and I expect that to be before the summer recess. I also expect that the data will show that the amount of community charge collected continued to decline up to the date it was extinguished, should this bill pass today. Further council tax collection statistics will continue to be published as routine. And for these reasons, presiding officer, I would ask Gavin Brown not to press this amendment. Thank you very much. I now call on Jackie Bailey unusually to speak in this amendment, and I will revert to the Minister at the end. I will call Cameron Buchanan after as well. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I understood that there was an open debate on the amendment, which is why I pressed my button to speak. Um, can I say that I have sympathy with the substance of what um, Gavin Brown says? Um, we also want to make sure there are no unintended consequences or impact on the collection of council tax. We already monitor, as I believe, and publish collection rates, um, and therefore I don't believe we need to put it in legislation. The one thing I am sure of is that local authorities will be extremely vocal in ensuring that attention is drawn to any reduction in collection of rates, despite their considerable efforts to recover debt, and I suspect the Local Government Committee of this Parliament will do likewise. For those reasons, we won't be supporting the amendment, although we have sympathy with its intentions. Thank you very much. I now call on Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would not usually expect to be speaking at the stage three of the bill so soon after having Thank spoken. Microphone, Mr. Buchanan. Sorry. So soon after having speak, been speaking at stage one, but then again, this government seems to have little desire to listen to most people's views on removing liability to pay community charge. I have said before that there are many worrying questions, and I am compelled to ask them again. How is this bill fair to the people who paid the charge? Will it stand up to the legal challenge from those who would understandably seek compensation? Will the, comp will the compensation be offered to local authorities be reviewed to match the true cost of this policy? 
What will be the total effect on the worrying precedent this bill sets on tax avoidance? Will its impact be monitored? Mr McCannon, are you speaking to the amendment or are you making your speech that would, we would expect in the open debate? I'm speaking because you asked me to speak. I think you're speaking, uh, your speech should come later. Right. I will now revert to the Minister if there's anything further you wish to say before I ask Mr Brown to wind up this amendment. Content. Thank you. Uh, Gavin Brown, to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please. Presenting off, thank you. Um, I'm a little disappointed at the government's response, I have to say, not uh, hugely surprised. Um, he says the, the Minister says the burden would be unhelpful. Well, I suspect it would be a little unhelpful on the Scottish Government because it may shine a light on what the impact of the bill has actually been. I'm not sure it would be quite such a big burden and so unhelpful on local authorities. I think what would be more unhelpful is a situation where the collection rates do drop as a consequence of the legislation that we have passed, but they're unable to um, have any real recourse to the Scottish Government and there's no obligation on the Scottish Government to do anything about it. I think given the level of sophistication of local councils and their financial officers, they would be in a position in early course to give us an indication of how the collection rates have changed if they change. They may not change in practice, Deputy Presenting Officer, but the evidence suggested by seven councils was that they may well change and I think would be in a better position to know about that sooner rather than waiting till several months after the end of the financial year and then trying to do it driving backwards. Presenting officer, Jackie Bailey is right that I'm sure local government will be vocal uh, if the collection rates do drop, but the purpose of the amendment is to make sure that there is an obligation on the government, an obligation on the government to monitor and publish, because I think if that is there, then the government is more likely to listen to councils are more likely to be forced politically to act, as opposed to being in a position to more easily ignore councils. And for that reason, uh, I'll close just now, Deputy Presenting Officer, but press uh, Amendment 1. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, and there will therefore be a five-minute suspension, after which there will be a 30-second division.
now proceed with the division on Amendment 1. This is a 30-second division. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number one is yes, 13, no, 90. There were two abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. And that ends the consideration of amendments. The next item of business therefore is a debate on motion number 12344 in the name of John Swinney on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I now call on Marco Bianchi to speak to and move the motion in the name of John Swinney. Minister, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 2nd of October last year... On the 2nd, uh, Mr Bianchi, as a mark of respect to the Minister, could those members leaving the Chamber please do so quickly and quietly? Mr Bianchi. Thank you. Um, on 2 October last year, the former First Minister announced the Government's intention to introduce legislation to ensure that councils could take no further action to recover ancient debts that arose under the community charge, which of course we have all come to know as the poll tax. We are here not because we, we need to abolish poll tax. Strictly, that took place now 22 years ago. But now we deal with what that left behind. And today we vote on legislation that will draw a line under the last remnants of that tax and most importantly put one of its last bitter legacies behind us once and for all and ensure that all can come forward to register to vote without fear. The, the register is nothing less than the foundation we lay under our democracy on which everything else rests. All of what we do here is built on what has to be an authoritative and comprehensive account of those eligible to vote on the future of our country. It has to be so because if we are to be faithful to the principles of democracy, all those who have the right to vote should also be free and feel free to exercise it in practice. A fortnight ago at First Minister's questions, concerns were rightly raised about reports that many hundreds of thousands of people may not yet have transferred to the new register under individual electoral registration. Any loss of voters from the register is a concern, but any growth from genuine democratic spirit should be welcomed. And we can be proud of the democratic spirit our country showed in the referendum last year. There was an 85% turnout and a total of 4.3 million people on the electoral register, which was an all-time high. It's been noted, it's been praised, it's been celebrated in this chamber time after time as a sense of democratic engagement that is second to none. And yes, I know many of the new names on the register were 16 and 17-year-olds, for whom this was a democratic awakening of their own. But there were still significant numbers of people who registered again for the first time in decades or who had never registered at all before. We all probably know them or knocked their doors and spoke to them. Many were signed up to vote at makeshift stalls on high streets or in one campaign outside job centres. And it was clear to all of us that people were invigorated by the choice like nothing before. In a democracy, that sort of awakening is precious. It must be cherished. It must be nurtured. And so it was because of the high level of registration that after the referendum, the responses of some councils, just, just some councils, gave us concern. For example, Aberdeenshire Council was quoted in the media as looking at the register to track down people who owed poll tax debt. Quote, if they don't pay, we will go after them for that money. Unquote. 30th of September 2014. In defence of 
their proposed approach. These councils often referred to the statutory duty on local authorities to collect local taxes. And they do have that duty, as they should, because collecting taxes arising is important, as I reinforced in speaking on Gavin Brown's amendment. The abolition of domestic rates, etc., Scotland Act 1987 and the Local Government Finance Act 1992 do make it the duty of every local authority to collect the taxes that they are owed. So I understand councils who genuinely felt that they had to do something. It was their responsibility. While some had already ceased to collect, there was a space there for legitimate doubt. And so we wanted to make it crystal clear through this bill that local authorities were absolved of their obligations to pursue and collect poll tax debt. This is not simply a case of a voluntary arrangement to cease collection. This is to deal with that debt, that doubt, once and for all. We wanted to ensure, therefore, that the legislation is simple, straightforward and unambiguous. And it has to be said, it is one of the more short and to-the-point bills that we have uh, considered in this Parliament. That is why we have to put the issue beyond doubt by extinguishing the liability in this way entirely. Gavin Brown. Is it OK then for councils to look at the expanded electoral registers to track down council tax debts of, say, 18 years duration? Copiaggi. We have issues with uh, poll tax that created very particular historical circumstances, very particular levels of protest, disruption, deliberate non-payment, deliberate non-registration. That is what we are dealing with here. That is what we are trying to address. And I will come on to the issues of council tax because it is important that councils collect council tax and do so in a responsible way. But, you know, had we taken a, a different approach in this bill on for example, making it illegal to collect poll tax debt at all. That would have caused all kinds of difficulties. For example, if debtors weren't able to cancel repayment arrangements in time, councils could have found themselves breaking the law simply by receiving money. Or if a civic-minded individual simply wanted to make a gratis payment out of the blue, we wouldn't want to replace one uncertainty with another. But it's not only the basic poll tax debt which is extinguished. There are also all the associated liabilities that will be extinguished as well. These include the interest charges, the penalties that were imposed as part of the process for collecting poll tax. And as with many debts of this type, you know, as many money advisors will be aware, penalty can heap upon penalty and leave money still being repaid long after the principal would have uh, expired. And those who were paying off community charge debt up until the 1st of February include some of the poorest and most vulnerable in society who were unable to pay at the time and were paying small sums towards arrears every week. Extinguishing this historic debt will let local authorities concentrate on breaking the cycle of debt, as some of them explained in their evidence to the Finance Committee. And as we know, many councils gave up pursuing historic poll tax debt years ago. There are 10 councils that will not be receiving any money from the uh, settlement here because they had indicated that there was no further collection they were going to undertake. And I would point out that every single one of them has a council tax collection rate that is either at or higher than the Scottish average for, for in-year council tax collection. And in the, the state, you know, each of these councils has made a choice on this. They have made a choice for their locality that today we are making for the nation as a whole. And in the stage one debate, I reminded, and indeed just then, I reminded the chamber of the singular unfairness of poll tax. The history of that goes back for over a thousand years and members may be disappointed, but I don't intend to go over that detail again. But while I shouldn't have to say this, let me just repeat it one more time, that this government believes people should pay the tax for which they are liable under the laws of the land. And even after this legislation is passed, as I hope it will be, it will remain for each local authority to determine the most appropriate means to recover council tax debts. This bill leaves that liability to pay council tax unaffected and the local authority's duty to collect council tax unaffected too. The government will, however, expect local authorities to pursue debts in a way that is sympathetic to the debtors' needs and circumstances, as we always have. The bill also leaves unaffected the long-standing law that debts prescribe, as indeed most of that outstanding poll tax debt now almost certainly has. 
In 2013-14, the authorities that still collected community charge debts collected a total of only 327,000. That was down from £1.3 million in 2009-10, just a few years before. The total collected has clearly been declining every year. And the collection rate for community charge over its lifetime was 88.4%. This compares with in-year collection of 95.2% for the council tax and the expectation, as I said, that more than 97% of council tax will be collected once follow-up measures are taken. In the last week, we have read reports of one council after another setting their budgets. And let us be honest, it has not been without controversy and debate and extensive discussion. But this time, this first time, they need not take any element of the community charge into account as they do so. Not just those authorities that had willingly uh, already stopped, but all authorities. And I would just like to thank at this point everybody who has been involved in making sure this happens, in partnership with local authorities, dealing with the expedited timetable, officials and uh, officials in Parliament, because with all of this cooperation by parliamentary authorities and local authorities, we were able to do this so that it could be in force for the start of the next financial year. And I move that the Parliament agrees that the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alec Riley, seven minutes, please, Mr. Riley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would, I would begin where I, I forgot at the stage one was to thank the Finance Committee because the Finance Committee did a, a good piece of work um, on this bill and, and taken evidence that I think was really useful um, and, and that should be put on the record. I did say that, that Labour would support this bill at stage one um, and that we would support the passage of this bill as speedily as possible. And I think it is right to draw a line under the poll tax. Um, you know, it, it's right also to say that, that the success of the referendum in terms of the numbers of people that actually registered to vote should not then have resulted in some of these statements that were made. And I think the then First Minister was absolutely correct to say that, that he would legislate. And we're, we're certainly happy to be here to be supporting um, this bill today. We heard many passionate speeches in this chamber about just how, how bad, how unfair, and the misery that was caused to communities um, up and down Scotland and to individuals in communities as a result of the poll tax. Um, it was a bad tax, it was a wrong tax, and it needed to go. But there's a couple of other points that I made um, in stage one that I think it's important to make again. The Finance Committee took evidence, and the point was made, I think, by East um, Ayrshire Council, where, where they said that they, they had taken evidence from people who had a struggle to pay, um, but paid the council tax, paid the poll tax, even though they objected to it in principle. And I think today it is important is when we draw a line under the poll tax, it's very important that we do equally recognise that many people throughout those, those diff that difficult period paid the, 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 the poll tax. Um, for some of those people, they absolutely struggled to pay the poll tax, but they did so. And they did so because they valued local government services. And if you remember back to that time, I was a member of Fife Regional Council at that time, the poll tax threw local government finance into turmoil and it had the, 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 the probability of um, throwing services into uncertainty and turmoil. So to all those people who did pay and struggled to pay, we should equally say today, thank you to them, and we recognise that they made a sacrifice at that time. But it is right to move on for there. It's also important the Deputy First Minister, First Minister did point out in his speech at that point that in terms of collection, um, by 2013-14, the amount of monies that was being collected was down to £327,000. And there has been now a deal agreed with COSLA, 
Um, and my view is, and it's a view that I think we need to take on board, is we were at the stage where councils, it was, it was getting to the point where it could be costing councils more money to collect than they were actually able to collect. So by and large, as the Minister has said, and as we've saw through the evidence, many councils had stopped collecting, and councils were at the point where it was becoming really difficult to collect much more. So for that point of view, I think you know, we are taking the steps today to formalise this, but we were really at that, that point where very little of this money was actually going to be collected. So it is right to draw a line and, and, and pull a line over it. But there's a couple of other points, I think, that, that, that come from the debate. I think it was Perth and Ken Ross Council when they gave evidence to the Finance Committee and they talked about having to pursue the poll tax and that interfering with some of the collection that they had of council tax and that some of the same families that were in debt those 20 years ago in terms of poll tax also had agreements in place and were paying back debts now in terms of the council tax. And what that shows us is that some 20 years on in communities the same families, the same individuals are still today struggling with deprivation and social inequality that they were some 20 years ago. And that has to surely tell us that there is more that we need to be doing to tackle inequality and to tackle poverty. The Deputy uh, First Minister said that those paying off community charge debts include some of the poorest and most vulnerable who were un unable to pay at that time and are still in arrears, having their arrears deducted from their social security benefits. And you know, that should wake us up that, that, that whatever poverty strategies have been put in place are still not working for many communities and, and for many people and many families and, and gen it's a generational thing. We've not been able to break that cycle of deprivation and poverty that should actually shame us all in this chamber and we need to highlight that today and look at how we actually are going to tackle that. And it links to, to local government and the fact that we are talking about local government finance because the Minister talks about council tax and we know that council tax and its current form and certainly where we're at right now is causing major difficulties out there in communities in terms of not being a, 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 a sustainable way forward for finance and local government. And we need to find a way forward because the type of budgets that we're seeing local authorities announce this week and the type of cuts are biting into local government services right across Scotland. We need to find a way to properly fund local government finance. So some 22 years on for the poll tax being scrapped, we still don't have in place a proper mechanism of funding local government finance. And that brings me right back to my point about poverty, because I believe that you won't be able to tackle poverty and inequality in Scotland unless you have a national poverty strategy that links into a local poverty strategy and that at the heart of that and delivering that locally is the community planning partners and key to that is local government itself. Local government is the body that can tackle inequality and poverty at the local level and actually change things. And if it's not financed properly close, and if the local government finance is broken, then that won't work. So today it is with pleasure, I think, that we'll see this bill go through and we can draw a line under the poll tax. But the message is we have to sort local government finance. Many thanks. I now call on Gavin Brown. Five minutes, please, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we've been against this bill uh, from the very beginning. We've been critical of the uh, way in which it was announced. We've been critical of the lack of consultation. We're against the bill in principle, and we're concerned about the pragmatic aspects that could flow from it. Uh, let me deal just firstly with a, a point made by the Minister, and a point I tried to make in an intervention. The government tried to paint this as some kind of high-minded uh, safety for democracy that they have to bring in in order to protect democracy and the electoral role. They say that people should be, feel free to register without the fear of being chased for tax. What they don't say, though, presiding officer, is that that only applies to community charge. If councils want to use the expanded electoral rules to chase up council tax debts of 17 or 18 or 19 years old, that apparently is okay 
from the Scottish Government. Not only is it OK, the Finance Minister is enthusiastic about councils using their powers and using that expanded electoral role to chase up old council tax debts. So I just think the narrative behind it about how this is a protection of democracy falls somewhat when it applies only to one tax, but not to another tax, which could be decades old. And a tax about which, I have to say, in years gone by, the SNP in particular, have been pretty aggressive. And they've said some pretty unpleasant things about council tax, pretty close to the things they've said about the community charge. Now, it was all very different, of course, last week, when, or a couple of weeks ago, when the Finance Minister was praising the council tax and said, I think, on the record about how it is linked to the ability to pay. Uh, but that's it's a very stark contrast uh, to what many SNP members said in the last session of Parliament, where we can find a whole plethora of quotes about how awful uh, they feel the council tax actually is. Presenting officer, I said we're against it on principle, and the principle is fairly straightforward. It's a principle espoused, I have to say, many times by John Swinney himself. People should properly pay the taxes for which they are liable. And on this side of the chamber, we don't deviate from that in relation to the community charge. We think that is the way it ought to be. But we also think there is a principle here. There should be a principle of equality between those who paid the tax and those who didn't pay. What we have now, of course, is an idea where if you paid the community charge, even if you were against it, as I know many in the chamber, uh, or the majority in the chamber were, people may have paid it and made great sacrifices in order to do so, but those who didn't pay it, some of whom probably could have paid it quite reasonably, are let off. And there is an, uh, there is an inequality between those. And I looked through the Finance Committee notes, and I, this is a live issue that has been uh, sent to many MSPs. I note the convener of the Finance Committee who said on the record, I imagine that most, if not all, MSP, like me, received a number of communications from constituents who have said, in effect, what about those who paid at the time? And he goes on to say this, we are all getting correspondence about it. I have not had anyone tell me what a great idea the bill is, but I have had plenty of folk writing to me in the terms that I have just described. Those aren't the words of a Conservative MSP, Deputy Presiding Officer. That's a direct quote from the convener of the Finance Committee, who I have to say did far more consultation on this issue than the entire Scottish Government combined. So we're against it in reasons of principle, but we're against it too for reasons of pragmatism. And that was what the amendment we uh, lodged earlier today was about. Because council after council, in giving written submissions to the committee, and councils giving evidence to the committee, even those who were supportive of the bill, like, for example, Dundee City Council, were concerned about the impact that it could have on the collection of council tax. Would you sure, of course. Does the member not think that a, a worse example is the big companies and the rich individuals who hide their tax overseas and there's a huge tax gap? Are they not the ones that should be pursued? Evan Brown. So we're, we're, we're happy to debate uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance of any nature in this chamber at any time. But today, debate, today we are debating stage three of a specific bill in front of us, which I'm sure Mr Mason acknowledges. And of course, we are of course, confined to talk about the contents and the impact of that particular bill. If he wishes to use his debating time to debate other stuff, so be it. We're happy to debate at any time. But our remarks, of course, have to be confined to the bill in front of us. Deputy Presiding Officer, as I said at the start, we're against it in principle, we're against it in practical terms too. It had no consultation whatsoever from the Scottish Government and there could be some unforeseen consequences and for that reason we will not be supporting the bill and we will be voting against at five o'clock today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move to the open debate and I call on Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. What this debate is not about is the principle of paying taxation. It's about the final burying of the poll tax. Like many members in this chamber, I have recently filed my income tax and have paid my income tax. Well, it's not ecstatic to do so. I was happy to do so because it took cognizance of the ability to pay. It was banded and it went towards the protection of necessary public services. The poll tax was an entirely different entity. It was a political tax brought in by the Conservatives, brought in a year earlier in Scotland, using us as a guinea pig for the taxation that ultimately bit the dust 
Despite, as I say, the best endeavours to advise better counsel and wiser counsel on Margaret Thatcher, some from even within her uh, own party, uh, she finally fell with it. So I was proud to take part in the Can Pay, Won't Pay campaign because it was about ensuring that those who couldn't pay wouldn't ever have to pay. We did defeat the taxation, and this bill finally puts to bed the last few remaining individuals who are being pursued for this iniquitous tax. And it was an iniquitous tax. It was a tax upon the poor and the vulnerable. It didn't take into account the ability to pay. It was about marginalising society, whereby if you weren't contributing uh, to health or education, well, if you don't have a child at school, why should you pay for education? And if you don't have ill health because you're fortunate and healthy, why should you worry about those who are afflicted? It was about dividing and divvying up in the privatisation of our society that has sadly been continued uh, through more recent governments. And it also was about the undermining of government services at local level. Alec Rowley has been making appropriate points, but let's remember, and I touched upon this in the stage one debate, the gearing effect was all about either having councils ratchet up the poll tax to an unaffordable level or seek to privatise and dispose of council services. So that's why it had to go. Are there a few individuals who probably will escape who should have paid? Sadly, probably just a few. But what we're talking about, as I say, is an overwhelming majority after 20 years of people who just cannot pay. And why is that? Because this was a taxation where we had expedited powers. And I do know that we have expedited powers with inland revenue to be able to deal, whether it's with MSPs or others who don't pay their tax. And that's rightly so. But as John Mason was correctly saying, uh, in inland revenue terms and income tax and other taxation, especially more complicated ones, accountants and both tax avoidance and sadly tax evasion kicks in. But for the ordinary man or woman in the street, the ordinary individual struggling to pay their community tax, that was in fact imposed and dealt with quite simply by local authorities for those who were able to pay. Because let's remember there was dealt with by a summary warrant an expedited procedure that didn't require the council to raise any particular action. It was printed off on a computer. It was passed to sheriff officers who at one stage could use a warrant sale to intimidate and get money that way. But for the overwhelming majority of people, it was dealt with by either a bank arrestment or an earnings arrestment. So the people who have left, who have not been able to pay, these ones that are being pursued are those who simply cannot pay because councils tried to pursue them but couldn't, and the reason that they couldn't get anything from them is that, in the main, they simply do not have the wherewithal to pay, and to seek to pursue them would be fundamentally wrong. The final point, presiding officer, is simply it is about protecting the poor, but it's also about dealing with those councils who shamefully wish to intimidate and try to put people off the electoral register. There was a brazen political attempt after the outstanding sign-up campaign and politicisation of the referendum by Tories in particular to seek to do to people what has been done elsewhere in other jurisdictions to try to dissuade them from exercising their Must democratic close, mandate. And on that point, I end, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Alex Salmond. Uh, Presiding Officer, I was very happy to support this bill very soon after um, it was published, and I think uh, it's the right thing to do. I think we uh, have to respond to the points raised by uh, Gavin Brown because the Conservatives are the only people opposing this today. And I would say to him, in terms of his fears about uh, the council tax, I would remind him what uh, Perth and Kinross Council told uh, us when we were on the Finance Committee that further attempts to collect would be expensive and could come at a cost to council tax collection. So I would invite Gavin Brown to consider this bill as the put all your energy into collecting the council tax bill. And if you look at it from that point of view, I think it could well be very positive, even from his point of view. Gavin Brown. It's generous in giving away Australia, but I mean, he talks about Perth and Kinross Council, but they said as well, beyond this issue, we have concerns about the potential impact of ongoing collection of council tax. Well, that seems to contradict the quote that I've just given. Anyway, I think the other more uh, fundamental point, of course, that Gavin Brown was making, that he, that, 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 that he doesn't regard the poll tax as different from other taxes. And I suppose most of us in the chamber do. And that's the fundamental dividing line, I think, between the Conservatives and other people.
people in uh, the chamber today. And, and that's also why I don't think it will lead to these effects uh, on the council tax. There's never been a mass non-payment campaign about the council tax because people, even those who are concerned about it, recognise it's a fundamentally different tax because it is related uh, in various ways to the ability to pay. And the collection rates show that. We have very high rates for the uh, council tax, much lower rates when the poll tax uh, existed. So I believe his fears are unfounded and I believe in principle we have to regard the poll tax as a fundamentally different tax, certainly different from any tax that I've ever known in my lifetime, the most unfair and inequitable tax and of course large sections of Gavin Brown's own party uh, realised that at the time it split his own party uh, and united the rest of the country against it. So I think this is a historic day when we put the final nail in the coffin of the poll tax and for those of us with long political memories of course, it, it, makes us, it reminds us of the campaigns we were involved in in the late 80s and early uh, 90s against it. And it was uh, fundamentally different from any other uh, tax that we have ever seen. Now, of course, there are people uh, outside as well who may have concerns about this and may have written to us about this. So I would make to them some of the points that I've made to Gavin Brown there. But I think also it's important to, to people who have concerns to put the whole thing in perspective. And one thing I say to people actually is, well, you know, this is just a Scottish issue. They haven't been collecting poll tax in England for 10 years. I realise there's legislative reasons for that, but it does help to put it into perspective. And, of course, the other point that members have made is that there isn't much left to collect anyway. And I think we should remind people that... Uh, Ten local authorities don't collect it anyway, but only £327,000 was collected last year. And I think that just helps to put, take a little bit of the heat out of the argument, because I understand that some people will feel uh, very uh, intensely about this particular issue, but I think that helps uh, to put it into uh, perspective. So I, 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 I'm glad that most people in the Chamber are united uh, behind this uh, bill uh, today. I accept the Conservative Party perhaps because uh, they introduced the poll tax uh, have uh, a certain uh, affection for it still and, uh, and don't wish to uh, separate it from, from the other taxes uh, that, that, that succeeded it uh, and, and, and I understand that but I do think that most people in Scotland will be very pleased that today we're finally drawing a, lunder, a line under that whole uh, era of unfair uh, taxation. Of course as Alec Rowley said the important matter now is, is to fix local government finance. We haven't come up with the best solution yet but I think everyone's agreed that the council tax was a big improvement on the poll tax. So, yes, let's, uh, let's make sure that everyone, uh, all our energies are devoted to collecting the council tax in, because, my goodness me, local government needs it. Can but let's close, uh, cast into the history books and the dustbin of history the unfair and unwanted poll tax. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Salmon to be followed by John Mason. A Deputy Prime Officer, uh, I speak not so much as the uh, Member of the Scottish Parliament from Aberdeen East, but as Alec from Stricken, mm -hmm. who was moved to, uh, to phone the Call K phone-in programme on this uh, very subject. And what moved me to do that was the enthusiasm being displayed by Councillor Jim Gifford, the leader of uh, Aberdeenshire Council, who seemed to want to use the enlarged, magnificently enlarged electoral register as a means of hounding down people uh, for debts which were uh, 20 years old and more. Now, there were three particular difficulties I found with Councillor Gifford's uh, argument. One, he seemed oblivious entirely to the fact uh, the pittance that was being collected by Aberdeenshire Council most certainly meant they were in the position that Alec Rowley uh, outlined, that it was costing more to collect than actually it was being collected. He, he seemed unaware that much of the outstanding debt was an illusion. It was either owed by people who never existed in the first place or who had long since demised in the last 23 years. It was a mythical debt in terms of its total. Uh, and thirdly, he seemed unaware uh, that people who were either collecting the, having the debt collected from them had probably paid it many times over, as the Minister indicated, because of the cumulative charges. And people who hadn't been paying the debt, by definition, if it was new debt, it was outlawed by the 20-year rule, since, by definition, poll tax debt is more than 20 years old. All of these things Councillor Gifford was unaware of. Hence, I was moved to, to enter the debate in the, the Call K programme. But it does strike the importance and the connection where there should be between non-payment eh, and voting. It has been widely reported eh, in the press that the Liberal Democrats owe £800,000 
to the Scottish Police Service, an £800,000 debt that they are refusing to pay. Uh, now, the Labour Party, the Scottish National Party, the Green Party, for all I know, the Scottish Socialist Party, pay for the security at their party conferences and have no debts outstanding. But it's been widely reported that the Liberal Democrats owe £800,000. It's even been reported that the Conservative Party have an outstanding debt to the Scottish Police Service. Now, I don't know if that's a non-payment campaign. <laughs> or, or, well, in the case of Liberal Democrats, maybe they're short of money. The Conservatives can't be short of money by definition, since their tax-evading donors make sure that they are not <laughs> short of money. Uh, but I would never, even given these circumstances, draw the conclusion that these people should be stopped from voting in this parliamentary chamber because they are engaged in a non-payment campaign, deliberately or otherwise, uh, to the Scottish Police Service. Mind you, the Liberal Democrats look like they've beat me to it uh, <laughs> in terms of not turning up to, to vote or to debate in the, the first place. It's a very dangerous connection to draw. Uh, and I was certain that day, by all means, Gentlemen, you are going to tell us. Interesting, the member criticising others for not being here to vote or debate. But let's move past that. Um, if it is so iniquitous, and why is it okay for the Scottish government? Why is he so enthusiastic for the Scottish government to use the electoral roll to chase up a 19-year-old council tax debt? Because of the three Lord reasons Alan. that I outlined. Firstly, that the poll tax was costing more to collect in many circumstances than could be collected. Secondly, because it's a mythical debt that many of these people either never existed or do no longer exist. And thirdly, the important point I made, the small amount that being paid were from people who have already paid many times over. And by definition, Mr Brown, if it's new debt, it's caught by the 20-year rule on the poll tax. All of that and more that this was the most iniquitous tax of recent modern times. Yep. And if I were the Conservative Party, I would be trying to forget the poll tax, <laughs> not to make everyone remember it. And I notice that Mr Brown did not take the opportunity to deny that there might be an outstanding debt from the Conservative Party to the Scottish Police Service. If so, I'm sure, if that's not the case, I'm sure I want to come to the Chamber and explain why that bill does not seem to have been paid. Well, I would never close. draw the conclusion that therefore Mr Brown and his colleagues shouldn't be allowed to vote in the chamber. Mr Deputy Grinding Officer, democracy is a precious thing. We have a 98% a registration on the voters' register. We have an 85% turnout in the referendum. That is so much more precious than any of the normal political arguments that take part in this chamber. We should defend it at every available opportunity. That is embracing a huge democratic experience. And if I have one criticism, it's not of this minister, the criticism is of myself as First Minister. I should have brought forward this legislation years ago. I wish that I had. Now that we have, let's put it through and bury this inequitous tax for good. Yeah. Thank you very much. I now call on John Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I have to say I'm very pleased uh, that this bill has got to stage three today and that it has the widespread support that it obviously does. This was a bad tax, and my colleague Kenny McCaskill put that very eloquently, eh, and others, I'm sure, are as well. So in the first place, this is not just any old debt that is being written off. There is a much stronger argument for writing off this tax debt compared to any other run-of-the-mill tax, because it was so unfair all along the line. However, the reality is that all debt needs to be evaluated at times. For example, eh, especially can it be collected at all, whether the cost of collecting it is what makes it worthwhile, and whether chasing it is actually detrimental to other objectives. And I would suggest that on all three of these points, this, uh, test, this uh, bill and this tax write-off passes the test. Firstly, clearly the vast bulk of it cannot be collected, uh, as people do not have the money, have died, or are not traceable. Uh, secondly, some councils have already decided it would be throwing good money after bad to pursue it and have stopped trying to collect it. And thirdly, councils like Glasgow have decided to pursue the council tax primarily, rather than diverting limited resources to the poll tax. And we should not really think that writing off debt is that unusual. Both private and public sector debt is first provided for if there is any doubt about its collectability. And that often occurs by providing 25% or 50% and so on, as the debt gets older without being collected. Once any debt has been provided for 100%, it can still be sitting in the accounts, but the net effect is nil as the provision matches the asset. Effectively, this is what has already happened with, council, with community charge, as I understand all councils have actually provided 100% of the outstanding debt. 
Writing it off, then, merely reflects the reality that this debt, to all intents and purposes, is irrecoverable. And again, it is not that unusual that those who pay tax, or any cost for that matter, are cross-subsidising others who do not or cannot pay it. Anything we buy in the shop includes the cost of shoplifting, and when we pay for gas or electricity, this will include the cost of those who default. So the Conservatives may try and make a big song and dance out of this situation, but in reality we are only doing what any business, any utility or whatever does on a pretty regular basis. Of course, as has been mentioned, there is a tax gap, and for the UK we gather that this is some £34 billion. And if we're starting off from scratch to close this gap, would we look at the few pounds here or there that we could get by people who are struggling? Or should we be chasing the big multinational companies who avoid tax through dodgy transfer pricing and the rich individuals who can afford clever tax experts and who move large amounts of their assets to offshore tax havens? Presiding officer, I do think there is a moral question in here. Are we pursuing unpaid tax from the rich and powerful with the same enthusiasm as from the poorer and weaker? <coughs> I think the SNP, Labour, the Greens, the Independents are pretty clear on that point, but I fear the Conservatives tend to side with the rich and the powerful against the weaker and poorer, and I really have no idea where the Liberal Democrats are at all. So I'm more than happy to support this bill today. I'm delighted that it has reached stage three. This is not just about a few thousand pounds or a few hundred thousand pounds. This is also a symbolic message that we are sending out today, that this parliament does not approve of taxes like the poll tax. This parliament will not introduce taxes like the poll tax in future. And this parliament will do what it can to make our society fairer and help those most in need. I congratulate the government on introducing this bill, and I look forward to it being passed today. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Cameron Buchanan. Four minutes, Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I apologise for speaking out of turn. And as they say in the radio programme, I'm oh, sorry, I'll read that again. <laughs> I'm going to be very nervous now pressing this wee green button again, I can assure you. The government seems to have little desire to listen to most people's views on removing liability to pay this community charge. I've said before that there are many worrying uh, questions, and I'm actually compelled to ask them yet again. How is this bill fair to the people who paid the charge? Will it stand up to the legal challenge from those who will understandably seek compensation? I think that's a very important question. Will the compensation be offered to local authorities be reviewed to match the true cost of this policy? What will be the total effect of the worrying precedent this bill sets on tax avoidance? For example, what about the council tax? We've heard from people about paying arrears of council tax, and I think this will definitely uh, uh, be effective on that. I think there are many worrying questions, and as, uh, as ever, this government won't give many answers. It seems obvious that removing the library... Certainly. Russell? I think the answer, perhaps, that the member is seeking, but why this government is so passionate, the passion that heard your speech, is very simple. Gavin Brown was, I think, uh, 14 when the poll tax came in. There are many members in this chamber who fought against the poll tax as the most iniquitous tax ever seen in Scotland. That is the answer to the member's question. Cameron McCann. Thank you. I was not 14, but I think it's a question of principle rather than anything else, rather than the age. It's a question of principle about paying taxes, not about whether the tax is fair or unfair. I wasn't really arguing that. I pointed out the collection rate was approximately 88%, which makes it clear that most people paid for their contribution. I'm still baffled by this government's position. I'm aware that they wish to cover new ground, but actively legislating to make all taxpayers compensate for the tax evasion of others, I think, reaches new heights of responsibility. This government is stubbornly refusing to rush this bill, is stubbornly choosing to rush this bill through Parliament, no matter the consequences. No responsible government would trample over fairness for the honest majority, but I think this government is doing exactly that. Certainly. John Wilson. Thank Mr Cameron for giving way. What would he say to his colleagues in Westminster who have actively supported those who have been offshoring their accounts to avoid paying tax in the UK? Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. I think that was more the point that John Mason was making. I wouldn't say anything at this stage because it's not what we're talking about here. This is a bill. No, it's not. We're talking about, we're talking about the principle of paying tax. And it's talking about the principle of paying this council tax. Order. Many of my constituents have also contacted me to express their opposition to the community charge debt bill, and they're absolutely right, I think, that it is unfair. 
No matter that the spin that is offered, it cannot in any way be fair to some people to be excused of their obligations while others are not. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Hard-working taxpayers should not be forced to subsidise other people's tax avoidance and the SNP's irresponsible rhetoric. For this policy to have any semblance of equal treatment, those who paid the tax would have to be reimbursed. And this is also a fundamental point. The government's retort to this may be that such remuneration would be unaffordable, yet this would only surely undermine the recklessness of the bill as a whole. The only practical, affordable and fair thing to do is to scrap the bill altogether. This is obvious to so many of my constituents and others throughout, and others throughout Scotland. It is important that we fully understand the consequences for local authorities' finances compared to the compensation on offer. 869,000 is only 0.2% of the total uncollected 425 million, which despite the government's protests about collection, the cost is far from adequate. The compensation is far from adequate. It still doesn't accommodate informal payments made to local authorities. And as somebody, as somebody said, uh, these taxes are still being collected, albeit slowly. And it, doesn't, it ignores also the potential knock-on effects regarding future tax payments to local authorities. The risk of losing council tax as a result of people expecting their debt to be cancelled at a later date has been highlighted repeatedly, yet this government has explicitly ruled out compensation being given to local authorities that suffer from a knock-on effect in council tax collection. With this in mind, you Gavin Brown's amendment to, to require please. reporting on the effect of provisions on council tax revenues would have provided much-needed information. At the time of significant financial difficulties, the last thing councils need is a government that removes debt they are owed. However, however difficult it is to collect it. It offers only a tiny settlement in compensation, which I think is also a point, and encourages tax avoidance. The people of Scotland deserve to be treated fairly, which means that the honest majority should not be discriminated against in favour of tax avoiders and made to cover the cost of compensation. Must close, please. The only fair thing to do is to scrap this policy, and according to the presiding officer, I'll be voting against this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I call on Jackie Bailey. Six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And like others, can I start by thanking the Finance Committee and the clerks to the Committee for scrutinising the Bill in the run-up to this final Stage 3 debate this afternoon. Um, I think there is little dissent, aside from the Conservatives, to the intention behind this legislation. Um, as the architects of the poll tax, I am quite surprised that they're still intent on clutching onto it, given how discredited it is. But I have to say the question of whether this legislation is needed has actually been raised several times before. I absolutely agree that the increase in voter registration during the referendum is to be celebrated. Using that increase to pursue historic poll tax debt would have sent absolutely the wrong message about democratic participation. Let me quote the former First Minister, not something I'm sure um, he has heard me do often, but this is clearly a case of absence making the heart grow fonder, and certainly for Alex from Strickham. Um, but he noted, even he noted, that the bill, which was hurriedly introduced, has no practical effect because, and repeated it today, there is already a legal bar on chasing debts that are more than 20 years old. Cosler itself didn't believe the bill was necessary. And I am very pleased that the Minister acknowledged that a substantial and very welcome element of the increase in voter registration was amongst 16 to 18 year olds who were not born when the poll tax was introduced. Indeed so. I wonder if the member might care to just clarify what she said. There is a 20-year bar to recovering debts rather than chasing them. And isn't that kind of the point? In, uh, Bailey, you, you are quite right. There is a 20-year legal bar on recovering debts. Um, but most local authorities, I think you'll find, said that practically it was too difficult to actually chase down those debts after such a significant period had elapsed. But the government, having decided to legislate, wasted no time in bringing the bill forward. And we support the bill. And I understand the need for speed given the circumstances, but it's clear that consultation was sacrificed as a consequence. A more detailed conversation, indeed. Alex Salmond. Uh, since I, I'm here to reciprocate uh, for, for, for Jackie Bailey, the point about the, practi the practical effect, uh, she rightly touched on, and perhaps she should reflect on the point, it's about the messages, as she said, 
that were being sent out. Uh, the reason I phoned up the phone-in programme was because of the messages that were sent, being sent out by the Conservative leader of Aberdeenshire Council. Uh, and these messages could have resulted in people being frightened to stay on the electoral roll. Does she accept that point? Jackie Bailey. Yes, I do. And I actually happened to tune in to Cole Kay um, and was very surprised to hear um, yourself described as Alex from Stricken. But there you go. By that time, I think you'd announced that um, you were retiring to the back benches and I suspect you were enjoying phoning in something that you hadn't done previously as First Minister. Um, but I do believe a more detailed conversation with key stakeholders would have been helpful and I welcome, therefore, the evidence taken by the Finance Committee. I agree with the majority of members in this chamber. The poll tax is totally discredited. It has been overwhelmingly rejected by the people of Scotland. It has finally run its course, and tonight we have the opportunity to consign it to the dustbin of history. Members across this chamber, though, recognise that people who paid their poll tax and who in many cases struggled to do so will feel the government's decision is unfair. But I think Malcolm Chisholm got it absolutely right. The amount actively being collected is small. It is practically hugely difficult to track down and collect the rest. And let's be clear, local government is rightly focused on making sure council tax collection rates are high, and we should applaud them on their efforts. But finally, presiding officer, I want to turn to Alex Rowley's concluding comments, because I think he hit the nail on the head. The real debate isn't about this bill, important though it is, but actually the real debate is about how we finance local government. And not as some abstract thing, but how we properly fund schools and education, how we properly fund our home helps and our care homes, how we properly fund the maintenance and repair of something as basic as our roads, never mind the range of services provided by local authorities. Members will have heard me say in this chamber before that local government has borne the brunt of the Scottish Government's cuts. Real strain has been placed on their ability to provide a range of services needed by our local communities. The Cabinet Secretary has been fond of pointing out that the cut from the UK Government to the Scottish Government is 10% and that is a matter to be regretted. But what he's done is passed on, in some cases, 20 to 22 per cent cuts to local government. I welcome the Commission on Local Government Funding. I believe it meets next week. It is essential, but we need to look at the wider issue, not just of the council tax, but how we fund local government in a much more sustainable way. If the Scottish Government is up for doing that, they will have the support of these benches. In the meantime, presiding officer, I'm pleased to support this bill and banish the poll tax from Scotland forever. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Uh, presiding officer, let me begin uh, with a response to some of the remarks that Alec Rowley made, because Mr Rowley, um, I think, identified uh, an important point at the outset of this debate in my response that um, as we take the final steps to abolish the outstanding debt arising from the poll tax, uh, we should remark on the fact that many, many people in Scotland, and it's a point made by the Conservatives as well, paid their poll tax, uh, many of them through financial hardship, many of them as a response of taking part, as my uh, friend and colleague uh, Kenny McCaskill did, as many of us did, um, in the non-payment campaign, but fulfilled our obligations once the poll tax had been abolished in the early 1990s. But people made genuine sacrifices to ensure that public services were properly funded. And I appreciate, and I've had correspondence from members of the public who paid their poll tax and who are um, concerned about the fact that the government is acting to uh, uh, abolish the last um, remnants of the poll tax today, um, that we appreciated and welcome and value the contribution those individuals made to the public services of Scotland and to, to funding uh, those public services. Now, the point that I advanced in the Finance Committee, which addresses many of the issues that, the, that have preoccupied the Conservatives' position, is that I think there is a, a false comparison made here between the poll tax and the council tax and the issues of collection that may arise. Um, the difference between the poll tax and the council tax is that the poll tax is a dead tax. It is no longer functioning. 
and the council tax is a currently operating tax for which our local authorities have a commendable and constantly improving success rate at collecting the, co the, the, the council tax. Uh, the average in-year co uh, co collection rate for the council tax in Scotland is 95.2 per cent. Mr Biaggi, the minister, in his opening remarks, made the point that in the local authorities in Scotland who are no longer voluntarily collecting the poll tax have a higher in-year collection rate for the council tax than the average rate in Scotland, which demonstrates that this issue that somehow non-collection of the poll tax and its out outstanding arrears in any way affects council tax um, collection is a myth which is not substantiated by the evidence. Yeah, of course, Brown. Seven of the councils who gave written or oral evidence to the Finance Committee make that point. That is a question that Mr Brown can ask the seven councils concerned, but for me the evidence demonstrates that where councils stopped collecting the poll tax, where they still have outstanding arrears of poll tax, it is not in any way undermining their ability to collect the council tax. So the, council ta the, the, the poll tax is now uncollectible, as the data would show, with the fall-off to a collection in 2013-14 of just £327,000. Now, one of the other issues that was raised in the debate was the whole issue of tax compliance and uh, the importance of people paying their taxes. We have wrestled with many of those issues as a government and the steps we have taken forward on land and buildings transaction tax, on landfill tax and on the Revenue Scotland Bill. And what we have done in the cold light of day, and I think it is a point that resonates with what Mr Mason was making and the points he was making in his argument, we in the cold light of day decided to set the highest possible standard we could by applying a general anti-avoidance rule in the Revenue Scotland Bill to ensure that the signal was sent out very clearly that we expect people to pay their taxes, and that is the approach that will be taken by Revenue Scotland in the period going forward. Now, one of the interesting things about this debate tonight, this last and final debate, which I hope leads to a vote tonight, in which the last remnants of the poll tax are, uh, are abolished, is that the debate has been graced by contributions by the two remaining uh, members of the Scottish Parliament who actually took part in the parliamentary votes about the poll tax when it was conceived into legislation in the late 1980s, Malcolm Chisholm and Alex Salmond. And Malcolm Chisholm, I thought, uh, both of them, I should point out, voted against the introduction of the poll tax, but just for the, the sake of the record. But Malcolm Chisholm made, I thought, what was a, a fascinating point that after all these years of the miserable impact of the poll tax on the reputation of the Conservative Party in Scotland, here we have, in 2015, the Conservatives desperately clinging on to the last discredited vestment of the poll tax. What does that say? about the Conservative Party in Scotland. It says that they haven't changed one iota since the late 1980s and the early 1990s. And I do, think, I do think it is important that the debate has heard the contribution of our former First Minister, uh, the member for Aberdeenshire East, and as he may affectionately be known as Alec from Stricken. But I think the fact that we're here today, well, the fact that we are here today considering this legislation is a direct result of the determination of Alex Salmond, as in so many other areas of policy, to ensure that the right thing was done to address an injustice in our society. And the tenacity and determination of Alex Salmond to bring this issue to the fore in the circumstances that he himself recounted of seeing the democratic enthusiasm of our country somewhat challenged by an enthusiasm to go back to the late 1980s and 1990s to collect historic debts on a discredited tax. And it's to Alex Salmond's credit that he has forced the pace of this issue and got us to the position that we're in today of being able to take the decision that we will be able to take at five o'clock to abolish the last elements of the poll tax. And finally, presiding officer, 
<coughs> and finally, presiding officer, can I respond to the, the, points that, uh, the, the point that Jackie Bailey made about properly funding local authorities and make a point to the Conservatives that this, uh, the financial agreement we reached with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities of £869,000 as a final payment was an agreement we reached with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. We don't always manage to reach agreements with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, but on this occasion I'm delighted that we were able to do that. But this Government remains committed to ensuring that local authorities are properly and fully funded to undertake the responsibilities that they are allocated. We know that the financial climate is difficult. We are wrestling with that financial climate into the bargain. But at a time when the Government's budget um, has been under real strain, we have taken the decision to properly and to fully fund local government in Scotland, and that is the way it will stay under this Government. That concludes the debate on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12343.2 in the name of Claudia Beamish, which seeks to amend motion number 12343 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the National Marine Plan be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12343.1 in the name of Alex Ferguson, which seeks to amend motion number 12343 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the National Marine Plan be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12343 in the name of Richard Lockhead as amended twice on the National Marine Plan be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12344, in the name of John Swinney, on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12344 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 98. No, 15. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to and the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill is passed. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting. <laughs>